press the button, <laughs> we might be live. Oh, God. So, there we go. We should be live now. It says you're live in big letters. Hello, everyone. It's us, Hello. the Goobers oh, from the Crimes. Yeah. <laughs> We're just goofing. We're just goofing about, boys. Hope everyone's having um, mm -hmm. a good evening or a good morning, wherever you are. Uh, mm. We've got a uh, topic. Wait, let's make sure we are live. Just make sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we, are. we are. We are. We are. We are. Uh, we do have a cool topic today, though, because we're going to talk about something that was pretty damn obvious to most people <laughs> who are in the Warhammer spaces. Um, if you can't do it correctly once, you can try again. Not really, because they did it pretty well the first time, though. But it's uh, Necron Lords, and we're also doing a bit, of, a bit of spicy Tomb King Lords as well. Mm. People might kind of start to notice if you're only like a Warhammer 40k fan or 30k fan. Um, there was a world that existed before, before GW decided to throw <laughs> literal yeah. horse crap at it <laughs> <laughs> and ruin it. And, and so, he ever chosen all over the place. <laughs> the, fact, the fact that it's called The World That Was is still upsetting in our oh, pain. Um, but yeah, in Warhammer Fantasy, uh, there was there was Tomb Kings before we had uh, Tomb... No, there was, was Necron Necrons Lords. Before we had Necrons. <laughs> there, was Necron, there was Necrons at home. Uh, before we had Necrons, here. this is so hard because they're exactly the same thing. Um, the Necrons were very, uh, after their re boys. retcon, were very much inspired by the Tomb Kings. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, but I think so. We're going to be discussing both of the, like kind of the best, like oh, well, basically all of, we're going to discuss, discuss, wow, discuss all of the characters that kind of. I guess you could probably see some inspired other ones, whereas others are wholly unique and we'll be getting into some of those juicy lore tidbits you probably might see some uh themes pop up they'd be like oh that looks familiar like copying someone else's homework um but before that though i think colin we have the question of the week we do uh, this week but what i'm already i'm rare i'm excited because <laughs> yeah, you definitely the last... said there's some spice <laughs> yeah the uh, the last one was you know hashtag secret or and uh, it was uh, just what are some secrets in warhammer uh, and uh, yeah, some of them, you know, some of, we get some pretty good ones. <laughs> One of them, you know, lit me up a little bit. Did you feel uh, personally attacked? I do. And then there was two small extra things I wanted to throw on top of that, both uh, related to the topic of lighting me up. Because holy shit, man! <laughs> uh, we'll uh, we'll go with the the first one I grabbed. Uh, Lollipop Night Two. Hashtag secrets. There actually truly never was a second nor an eleventh legion of the Adeptus Astartes. The Emperor just can't count. <laughs> uh, when nice. Kilman, the crazed account of them all, had the balls to call him on it, the Emperor injected vage memories of a purge into the Primarch's minds. Uh, he figured maybe it would scare his sons into better compliance, too. That'd be the funniest nice. thing if they revealed that's what happens. Like, you know, they never existed. It was just the Emperor gaslighting. <laughs> Guess like because he's embarrassed as well at the end of the day. Uh, at Huntsman seven two seventy four, uh, hashtag secret. The, the Inquisition doesn't want you to know this, but Exterminatus doesn't exist. Planets <laughs> just do that sometimes. <laughs> that was a that was a real tweet thread uh, where someone was like, "Yeah, nukes aren't real." Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> oh, why? Someone replied with Japan just did that. <laughs> oh, it just man. does that when no one's looking. <laughs> oh. And then uh, the last one, starting the topic of getting on my ass, <laughs> is uh, Air of the Redeemer 2828, hashtag secrets. Marathi once met Colin at her newest fling school reunion. Sources say she was disgusted, intrigued, and overall confused. Oh my god. Oh, is that your worst nightmare? <laughs> oh my god. Jesus. It hurts. Funny. It hurts especially because it's so like this person knows you. <laughs> it's a true Colin fan. <laughs> Oh man. Uh, and then uh just uh, one of the two extra things I wanted to throw in was Winter 8109. Uh Luther kinda was the Dark Souls 2 of the Dark Angels. <laughs> uh, so he was the best Dark Angel, easy sweet. No. He was the rushed out, 
you know. No diff. Oh, no. <laughs> he literally just killed the bed of chaos yesterday. I'm coming around to Dark Souls 2 being actually pretty good. Wow. It's, oh, no. not, it's not. Dark Souls, we're not going to, we're already, for people listening, we've already done a live stream about a tier list of every single Dark Souls boss fight. So if you want to go to see how we all felt about Dark Souls 2, <laughs> we can go to that one. It's on our channel. And but, then, um, uh, you guys like them? The other quick thing, you know, was, uh, you know, someone, I will name no names, uh, nothing about them, except they decided, they told me that I looked like the chicken man from Toy Story 2. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I was like, no. <laughs> No. Oh my gosh! It's not even the guy who like does the really satisfying <laughs> repair job as well. It's no. the chicken guy. It's it's the facial it's hair. Like, oh, that, that fucking killed me. This <laughs> is really That's funny awesome. though. I got that message. I was like, holy shit! <laughs> Honestly, how did that make you feel? <laughs> I, I started laughing when I got that message. It's like, holy shit! I just got fucking executed. <laughs> Holy shit, That's dude, you stuff. killed him. Can I just point oh, out that um, Eli is sitting there laughing all about this in his little like YouTube pimp jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got Show the, us. Look got at that. This. He's got for free. Yeah, they just sent it to you. I don't know. We <laughs> haven't got one. It's bullshit. Connor's not got his pimp jacket. Yeah, his where's mine? Be from shorts. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Oh, man, people. Chicken guy from Toy Story. DJ Beats, leave okay. Colin alone, okay? Oh, what's he doing now? <laughs> Slander. Uh, we appreciate DJ B. The, 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 the poll is in the way. <laughs> no, on, no. Let's go. People oh, need to type man. in what the rest of us look like, but please be kind. Oh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, if I'm getting heat it's like pretty, that, you guys are funny. in the shopping block too. <laughs> Fuck you. Yeah, I've already had discount Mr. Beast, and I don't like. I'm o <laughs> thing is, I'm okay with that. Like that's good enough for me. I you think, got Mr. Mm. Beast. I got the fucking Mr. <laughs> chicken guy. <laughs> We do look like similar, him. but he's a little bit chubbier. He's a little bit like oh, chubby yeah. in the cheeks. Yeah. All you can get I've... from this is just MF Doom, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. I've been called the Lucky Charms guy many times. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean... Short uh, and red hair, so what can you do? Uh, well, speaking of that, we do have another question of the week. Um, Andy, do you remember what the question of the week yes. was? Yeah. So this one is hashtag immortal. What would you do with immortality in the Warhammer universe? Mm. And we're going to say both fantasy and 40k? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Might as well. Pick, 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 a, pick a universe and decide you know, which one you're going to be immortal in. Mm -hmm. Just not end times. That's the, a, best, that's not the best idea is just to run to the webway and don't... I mean, I'd, I'd say <laughs> that, but then Zinch <laughs> set up like a tent mm -hmm. in the webway or something. But Zinch would get you eventually. Nah, the clown man would keep you safe. <laughs> is it technically true to say that you'd be immortal if you were trapped in Trezin's like uh, Tesseract uh, labyrinths uh, uh, or very technically museum? I guess yeah you can't do much but you're alive I guess do you have a like does he have a percept well if you're trapped in that do you perceive time flowing or not I think he can if he lets you like there's um, there I'm pretty sure there's oh, a mechanic God. like a tech priest who asked for that because he just wanted to like run computations and shit in peace well, there was Trayson. also the um the Black Legion guys and the Hammer and Bolter episode oh, yeah. were in one, and they just repeat. They go to this planet and they go, "We're going to steal this artifact from the Necrons." And every time Trezin's like, "You can leave whenever you want. You just have to choose not to invade," and they <laughs> never do. And so they just live in a repeating loop against the Drukhari in this little cube forever. Like, oh, it's sad, but it's the Black Legion, so who cares? <laughs> we will be talking more about him uh, later, though. But I think Eli, we're gonna. Mm -hmm get straight on in there because we're going to talk about perhaps some of the the fanciest smanchiest smanciest what the 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 true absolute chads of just any xenos faction although that could be argued because we have um xenos scum loving eldar fans here <laughs> <laughs> but um it's necron laws here like take it away yeah baby now they the necrons are the best of the best xenos they they uh, own the galaxy rifle rulers as yeah, it should right, be bozo. okay <laughs> um uh, i'm not gonna lie i read i was reading through like half of the uh nemesaur xandric and Oberon a short story and i had like five pages of notes so i decided to stop so this is a uh, xandric and Oberon episode as much as it is necron lords episodes but they're the best <laughs> necron lords so you, you can't complain too much just uh, a quick for you before we start mm -hmm. there are some necron lords we're going to mention today that 
to our heart's utter disgust they've removed from the codex if i do yeah, believe it's, it's very sad they still have lore tidbits in the codex though like in the first few pages they're there i looked but no rules so there, these are some around. salt into the wound <laughs> yeah so if some some people listening if you there are probably some necron lords you probably never heard about if you're a recent um person just started playing 10th edition or you're recent to warhammer law there are some i mean arguably probably more interesting characters we're going to discuss who again gw apparently just doesn't want to update their goddamn model for so yeah oh, uh, man, maybe next gonna... edition they'll come back but who knows oh pain but we're gonna get we're gonna get into it though yeah all right well oh colin's gonna die, colin's <laughs> gonna die. pardon me pardon me <laughs> Donate to the chat so you can get a new pancreas. <laughs> no, <laughs> fucking make that the reason. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Oh man! All right. Well, we're gonna start at the head of the totem pole, other than the Silent King, because he's just he just showed up. <laughs> but we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna start with uh, Imotech the Storm Lord, the uh, most epic guy in all the galaxy, who, in my opinion, is the best general in the whole galaxy. No diff, uh, Ultramarines. Sorry, bros. Uh, but Imhotek has <laughs> recently risen in the, I think it was in the 40th millennium, upon the crown world of Mandragora, only to find his dynasty, the Sautek dynasty, engulfed in a civil war. He was awoken by an ambitious noble, hoping to use the Stormlord's legendary prowess, but Imhotek had no time for games and slew the noble immediately, like the scrub he was. He then mustered his forces and swiftly ended the civil war. And he has since ravaged the galaxy. Uh, I believe he's carved an empire, something like he's gained like something like 80 tomb worlds. But I know Andy was telling me he found a much larger number. I don't remember what what the number was, though. I think Andy it's told like me, he's got the tomb it. worlds, but he's also conquered like loads of human worlds. And he's just like, I got hundreds of them. They're just like fun. Just say, oh, yeah. I've killed everyone. That's mine now. All your resources. So Big in books. like 200 years, the guy is allegedly gone more planets than the years he's been fighting uh so very successful obviously not imperium numbers but he's getting there he's uniting the uh, the necrons slowly but surely uh nemesaur zandrik calls them the taker of a trillion hands and master of three hundred thousand suns which i assume is reference to the times of old before the necrons went to sleep goes hard yeah i think my my favorite tidbit is that even the i think the Catan. It was mentioned in back in the War in Heaven millions of years ago. Even the Catan, I think, knew of him, mm -hmm. which is like crazy considering yeah. Necrons were to them mindless slave robots. So yeah. that's how dangerous yeah. he was. He, he, he made quite the name of himself back in the day. He wasn't like he was a general. He was just like I just like doing war because I'm good at it. He wasn't into the whole I want to rule. But then hmm. he came back and he's like, "What are you all doing? This is stupid. Where's the yeah. king? Oh, for God." I'll fine. I'll do it. I'll do yeah. it if no one else will. The I guess I should mention the Pharaon of the Sautic Dynasty did not wake up, unfortunately. So everyone was squabbling and trying to gain the power while they could. So they actually stopped the resurrection protocols for all the other nobles. <laughs> oh. oh my god! <laughs> the border <laughs> prince is coming with quite the take. Oh, I'm, I'm missing. I'm missing the chat. It's not showing up on my phone. <laughs> The storm lord is Thank a you, brother. <laughs> register and should have remembered his place. <laughs> Holy <laughs> Oh yeah, this did not think I'd be hearing Imotech slander today. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> Imotech's a G. He deserves everything. Uh, everything he gets. Uh, but essentially, they were squabbling for power. Some guy woke up Imotech because he thought that Imotech would help him find get the power. But then Im Imotech just took the armies and killed everyone, basically. Uh, and then <clears throat> got the allegiance of all the others. Uh, but anyways, more about him. It said that his voice sounds as solar carry-on tearing around a black hole. I thought that was a cool... Uh, Who's I, heard that it's before? Hard to, yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine what that is, but <laughs> Necrons have, I guess. So cool it would be like the equivalent of someone saying, that sounds exactly like shoving a human through a, a penny-sized hole. You go, how the <laughs> hell would you know that? Uh, I, I mean, when he's been... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, he has defeated every grand strategist that has come against him with a nice emphasis on Mr. Helbrecht. Take the L, Imperial Bros. He Sorry. cut off his hand. Yes, he did. Yeah. 
His mind is a machine of incomprehensible logic that can process amounts of information that would likely leave in even a Primarch's brain melted. That's what I like to think, at least. Uh, it's as if you took the world's greatest uh, supercomputer and you improved it by 10, and you gave it sentience and hatred for all the galaxy's life, and then gave it billions of undying warriors and a galactic empire. Uh, and I think that's a good way to sum up how dangerous the Storm Lord is. I think he's Does a... He? Hmm. Okay, well, does, he, does he hate all life? I always thought he was kind of like he just wanted like to conquer them rather than explicitly like kill everything. I think he's uh, not well in other ways. <laughs> if well, he's gonna go into it. Basically, basically all the Necrons hate life except for like Trazen and like a couple other ones. But uh, no, it, in in the Codex it even says that he won't like he won't rest or he doesn't see it as uh, Necron victory until every living being in the galaxy is dead. All right, fair yeah. enough. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's. And, and Doesn't he have a not... slightly complicated relationship with that, just because of his certain illness that we're going to get into? Because he doesn't <laughs> see other people the right correct. Oh, that's the, the, the wrong. That's the wrong guy. That's, 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 oh, that's, that's Sandrick. Oh, I thought, I, you were you were scaring me. I thought I, I yeah. thought I like missed something. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have am notes I, on this. But I, am I correct in also thinking that Emotech does not agree with uh, the Silent King about it. he doesn't want them to be flesh and blood again? He's like, nah, Skelly boys are cool. Yeah, I believe Stay so. As we are. There is a weird divide in the Necrons, where some of them want to go back to the time of flesh, uh, and others don't. But mo most oh, of them yeah. just hate flesh in general. It's the perspectives vary so drastically depending on what author is writing about them. So it's kind of hard to follow I mean, sometimes. They are also, you know, like a civilization. They're not all going to be, you know, yeah. have the same viewpoints. Yeah. But overall, all Necrons, even the ones who want to like go back to the time of flesh, they still hate all the other living beings because they're just, they're not even really sentient to them. They're just rats and vermin and insects, right? Uh, but we way, do have a, we have a, we Donation. I was going to say, we've got a donation. Do you want to read it out, Eli? Thank you, Ludi McShooty, for the $5. Thank you, brother, thank you. Thank you. When will we get a, uh emoji that my phone can't show tier list for... Yeah, okay. which god most likely not to call you back after sex? Triple S tier is a certain Dommy Mommy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <Jesus>. okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. The Emperor definitely doesn't call you back, surely. <laughs> Just like, use like, and abuse and then gone, right? You're basically <laughs> smushed into the <laughs> wall at that point. Look, it doesn't matter if Marathi doesn't call me back. I'm ending it because my life has peaked after that. Fact, Colin would hell. prefer it that way. Yeah. I feel like the Omnisai would just go like, error report 404, and that'd be it. Like, oh. mm -hmm. It would just be awkward with the Omnisai. Or like the machine <laughs> gun. Jeez, All um... that oil... For the, the, geez, for, you sorry, gotta move God. on or i am going yeah, to yeah, demonetize yeah, yeah. this podcast <laughs> oh man uh tom warren asked there says that you probably wouldn't want to go back to super cancer either and their, their goal is to live lives again and have souls basically they wouldn't they wouldn't want the cancer stuff but they uh, they are soulless and immortality is a curse and that's what everyone always seems to find out in stories right so their lives all kind of suck but they're doing okay, most of them. Is it old law? I might be. Is it Xandra then? Because I thought Imatech was the one who he still perceives, like his mind is broken and he still perceives everyone as like living beings. No, it does. And when he, du Zandric. when he duels, like he thinks he's dueling like real people. Yeah, that's still Zandrek, I think. He's like, oh, I keep, oh, I'm I still in the, confused. I'm still in the war in heaven. You're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, Night, time to go to bed. He's like, um, <laughs> oh, like Clint Eastwood. In that film, where he's like he's playing the old guy who's like kind of a bit of a badass, and Grand he's like, Carino? "It's maybe, yeah." And he's like, "You know, it's still the Korean War or something." Like, it's just not, <laughs> it's not quite. Jeez. Okay, uh, moving on though, because we do have a lot to cover. We got a lot to go through. Um, his the only downside of Mister Imutech is his pride, <clears throat> which is a weird thing for Necron. But I mean, they all have their weird quirks <clears throat> that are issues. Um, but it Aren't leaves him a downside as well. Yeah, but that's not like his flaw. That his it's his fatal flaw one, is pride. Um, but yeah, but he can't I'll, I'll fight orcs that. correctly, isn't it? He can. It just yeah, takes some gets time. Yeah, completely undermined because yeah. he's like, this doesn't make any sense, and this mm. should make that's sense. That's still the most work. amazing. Like, orcs just never disappoint, do they? <laughs> <laughs> Truly, uh, but he often mocks his opponents uh, and makes them feel bad instead of outright killing them. 
like the Hellbrex thing. He cuts off Hellbrex's hand and then kicks him off the bridge. And then he, oh, I'll get you next time. And then he doesn't get him next time. Another Necron W. Well, yeah, he did blow up his flagship. So he like, <laughs> yes, yeah, he did. Screw you guys. Yes, he did. But that wasn't a, that wasn't a war. Yeah, he still lost the war. Whatever. <laughs> he, had respawn- he had infinite respawns. It wasn't fair. <laughs> yeah. I, from what I remember, uh, Hellbrex basically beat, <clears throat> the uh storm lord down time and time again but yeah. Emotech was just laughing at him because he's basically the like the, just kept the like rebuilding gold and... tier like regen yeah surplus subscription so it just like auto fixes and you're like for god's sake yeah. stay dead he's the second see he's a, <laughs> <laughs> he a phylactery again. and a sempaternal weave which are nice but mr Emotech wages dozens of campaigns at once uh, making complex counter moves on a distant planet while he launches a surgical strike on another. The only beings he finds absolutely frustrating, as we said, are the orcs and also chaos, for they often defy mm-hmm. all logic and act in anarchy randomly. But uh, even then, it only gives them a tiny bit of leeway, and he often can figure it out eventually and still beat them. Uh, we have and another donation. Of... Thank you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, from uh, Maple Scaffolder. Thank you for the $5. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Keep it up, guys. My favorite Warhammer channel. Bless you. When are we going to get beginner expert Caiaphas Kane? Caiaphas Kane, sorry. Love from Alberta, Canada. Oh, baby, I'm in Alberta, Canada. Nice. nice. Uh, what do you also call love Alberta, Albertians Canada. or something? Yeah, yeah, Albertans. Come on. <laughs> Alberties. Albertans is close enough. <laughs> <laughs> Couple of Berties. Oh, man. I, th- I originally thought that your message said beginner to expert Colin. And I thought that was quite funny. <laughs> we should do a beginner to expert Colin. <laughs> Or a deep dive, the iceberg effect of Colin just getting down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, Caravis okay. Kane's quite a big one. So I this is his illegal like activity that he on. really doesn't want to know about. <laughs> <laughs> How many books are the Caravis Kane stuff? A lot. Seven? No, Six, seven, there, more than I, that. There, right? uh, I think it's like, yeah, around seven or eight. Hmm. But there, uh, there's a lot of side stories too. Yeah. So. It's the Gotrek and Felix <clears throat> effect. Where you're like, oh, it's the fun, funnest character. Oh, there's a million books. Okay. Mm-hmm. But, so, but I do want to point out one thing with uh, Emotech as well. One of his side projects is he wants to just get rid of the orcs. He's like, I don't like how they're winning. So he's like, <laughs> his side project is like, I want to genocide the orcs because they're an- they're annoying and I shouldn't be losing. And I'm a bad loser. So yeah, that's. I can't thing. blame him. Uh, from what I can tell, though, I don't know if he's actually ever lost, other than hmm. when Hellbreak blew up his ship. But he got away, and it wasn't like an actual war. Apparently, the Space Wolves beat him whatever take that as you will i just read that it was like one sentence so i'm not sure i i would need to read the actual book uh but <laughs> you know i mean i mean to be fair the more you fight the space marines the less and less protection you will have from their plot armor over time so eventually you know, the new always... armor your character plot armor wears off and then it has to fight the space marine plot armor yeah and then you i'm can... just waiting for hellbrecht primarist to like Get like round two, bitch. Like, oh no, he's <laughs> oh, no. Maris Cato Sicarius just oh, but the elbow drop your <laughs> ruin it, destroy him. Oh man, all right. Well, he, he's called the Storm Lord for the ability for him to call the dark and terrible storms that go all around him and his forces. And uh, the enemies <clears> within <throat> who are lucky are struck with the green arcane lightning and you know, atomized in an instant, but the less lucky guys uh, who maybe sometimes even leave the swarm are infected with the blood swarm nano scarabs, which nuzzle their way into their flesh and send signals to attract flayed ones who then come and tear them to shreds. Sorry, uh, DJ beats with that. Um, God, Immortech <laughs> got <laughs> killed. Immortech got on. killed by a space wolf. <laughs> don't, be, don't, don't be saying that. Don't be saying that. Okay, oh, we have brother. we have two donations. Thank you guys very much. Thank you uh, so much, guys. Thank you. Ludi McShooty for the five dollars. Legitimate question. When's the Oniverse Inquisition? I want to see who's better at being a xenophobe. And <laughs> if you do an iceberg <laughs> on Mr. No Slanesh would blush. Yeah, that would be cool. Uh I no iceberg I, me. I, yeah. <laughs> The next one is very appropriate. You know, you have to read that, that <laughs> one too. I, I, I will. Uh, we do need to do a versus episode one of these days, and it's been a while. So, but we only for Inquisition was one of our OG ideas, I think. So, but Maple Scaffolder, thank you for the ten dollars. Albertans for life. Please do be an expert of Colin. We will all love you guys for it. <laughs> what? I <laughs> iceberg effect Alberta. Anyone in the chat? <laughs> there's not. There's, uh, there's not much to it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> 
We have Banff, though. Banff is real nice. People come from all around the world. It's going to say Galaxy. But <laughs> it's <the same> thing. <laughs> Banff. Hmm? Oh, and, um, what is what Banff? Is the, it's a national the, park. The Boonsamt for Migration und Fluxlinch. That's all I found. <laughs> It's, well, a, it's, an, it's a, a, a oh my gosh! It's a park. It's mountains. It's beautiful. We have a lot of beautiful mountain stuff. I don't know what Colin here. said, but it sounded like a hate crime. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was it was German. It was it was German. So, oh man. Hey, well, people. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Wait. I'll, we can talk. We can do. Yeah, we have to keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Day, <laughs> oh man. Uh, he carries. Mr. Amotech again carries many powerful artifacts, the most important being the Staff of the Destroyer. And this staff has been passed down through generations, uh, first held by the founder of the Sautech dynasty, and is always weld by the Pharon. It can only fire after recharging for a long time, uh, but when it does, even Terminators are, you know, destroyed in front of Imotech. Upon his hand rests the Gauntlet of Fire, fairly self-explanatory. He has a phylactery and a semper terminal weave, something that a lot of nobles have that renders them basically unkillable aside from orbital strike type crazy stuff. Uh, and if that wasn't enough, he also has a phase shifter, so when you shoot at him, he's not even there most of the time. Uh, overall, in my opinion, he's perhaps the finest commander in the galaxy, and hopefully we can see him go up against other guys like Gilliman. That'd be really cool, although maybe not. Because as I said earlier, he's beat Space Marine plot armor a couple too many times. And Gilliman has the ultimate Space Marine armor. Uh, so I, it he's, might be a good a bit, story, but he might just win. So He's a bit frustrating because I think technically he has the biggest Necron army at, like ever. Yeah, he does. Like, even the, the Silent King doesn't have as many forces as he does. And it's like, what are you doing, Storm Lord? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Although someone mm. did ask, is this the guy on the white scars is um, Master of the Hunt list? No, that's Zandrek. It's a different guy. But yeah. Zandrek's a G. Zandrek you are, is the G. One, one final note. If you play him on the tabletop, you are legally required to play Barry the Light from Devil May Cry. <laughs> oh, that's a good shout. That's a great shout. Oh, man. Do we, what are you guys' opinions on his new model? Because I don't really like it. I think it's fine. I think it's... Uh, like, like I think it has a problem with a lot of other more recent stuff where like, you see in like Age of Sigmar they're willing to push the envelope a little bit more whereas 40k is a little bit more safe I, I did say they were trying to honor slash recreate his older model in some capacity I think it's fine like, it could have been more yeah but it's uh, fine that's, I guess so. I, Just, I think, it doesn't even it doesn't even look like his picture though I, don't like, I, I think don't know see how with... genuinely sad Eli is about this. He looks genuinely <laughs> I, upset. I, I think oh. the trouble with like Necron models in general is because, like at a glance, if you don't know who the character is, they all kind of merge into one. So like, they got the yeah. green and the uh, the gold and the silver. They're all kind of like unless you have a keen eye for it, you're like, who's this character compared to this character? It's like, oh, his head's slightly different shape. Like at least with um, the Storm Lord, uh, not Storm Lord, with uh, Silent King, he's got that big bloody plinth thing he's standing on you're like oh that's like a unique thing but a lot of the time it's just it's a guy with a staff and it's spiky and he's got a big cape yeah. you know, it kind of looks like yeah. that other guy who has a staff <laughs> and a big cape he's got lots of greens like yeah but like before his his old model you could tell it's Imotech, but now it kind of just looks like mm. a big necron lord yeah yeah, yeah. which like i mean if... like yeah it's like if Space Marines didn't have different chapter colors, who so like, yeah, this guy, yeah, uh, his armor is slightly <laughs> yeah. bigger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that it's a Marine's malevolent or yeah. is that an Imperial fist? Mm -hmm. We'll find out when they charge at us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it was like it was like early Great Crusade. They didn't have all their armor painted, so they literally all were in gray armor. And then mm -hmm. I guess that's how Necrons are really now. So could you imagine telling apart the Space Marine legions? Called, they all had gray armor. DJ Beast called me a chaos goddess. Oh no, that's that's probably uh, Andy. I assume. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I am a big fan of chaos, though. But anyways, I think I, I mean, who else could be as good as uh, Imotech at his job? Like, guy has supercomputer brain and the power of a star, uh, powering his logic engines and stuff. Like, it's it's pretty hard to go on to to go against. Um. But some of his ba battles are so famous, which we talked about in the Necrons pod a long time ago. Uh, he, they're saying in idioms based off of his events for the Necron tier, such as Gone Like the Kuvu, which people say after you clear your plate. 
uh, because the Kuvu dynasty was utterly and just completely destroyed mercilessly by Imhotep to the point where there was just absolutely nothing left. So when you eat all your food real fast and it's clear, you say, go on, you finish that like the Kuvu, basically. Uh, in the War of Heaven, like you said, the Katan knew who he was, but even more, the immortal god beings that were the old ones were afraid of Imhotep. So the actual gods feeling fear over a single dude. It's like saying the chaos gods are afraid of Cato Sicarius, which I mean, which they are I can't blame him, but they don't, but they did, but <laughs> they don't the say it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for a while, he spent a lot of his time uniting the Sautek dynasty, subduing upstarts and traitors. Um, so well that the majority of them now just bend the knee without question, because they don't want to get destroyed when Imhotep lands on their tomb world with the reemergence of the silent King. It is unsure how they will get along. Uh, because I've heard the Storm Lord is not a fan of Zark. No, and so it'd be they, so um, cool if they did a civil war. That'd be fun. I don't want them Ultra to do a civil like, war. What's going on? No over more, there? no more <laughs> civil <laughs> war. But the only, the only trouble is, is again, like I know it's their aesthetic, but there's, there's so much green. It's like Anrik here is a blue <laughs> oh, Necron. Yeah. But then having like this, the green Necrons versus the green Necrons. Right? <laughs> Who's yeah, here? I I don't want them to have a civil war. The Necrons have enough of that stuff. And I mean, logically, <laughs> it doesn't make much sense to further the dynasties. So if we're going off of the Bean, whose basis most of his decisions solely off of logic, I don't think he'd want to do a civil war. I, I think it would be like the angle of like, oh, the Silent King, he's trying to make us weak with being flesh again. Oh, where's he been? He hasn't been doing his job for the last 10,000 years. I've been holding the fort. I didn't even want this job. I hate this guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Knowing GW, though, I feel like they'll just try to nerf the Xenos who are beginning, who are getting too strong. So they will have a civil war and then it'll be bad times. But because ironically, attrition is what is the worst for the Necrons because for every, I don't know, 1 million warriors that dies, one of them can't be recalled and is gone yeah. forever. So, so Zahir Martinez, Emotech is currently waging a civil war against Sarek in the recent Pariah Nexus crusade book. So. Oh, that's, Sad news. <laughs> I have not read that. <laughs> the saddest part of the Necrons is that they'll never be new Necrons. For yeah. them, as in, like, there's a finite no number children. of Necrons forever, and it's only going to slowly decrease. Because, again, like, they all go, well, some of them just, I mean, a spoiler for some other story here, but some will mm -hmm. eventually go mad. So, yep. uh, well, I go into too much there now. Yeah. So but to be fair, though, uh, they are dwindling, yeah, but also it was like a. Starfair, an empire that was larger than the Imperium, and it's you know, and where the Imperium they have soldiers, um, but they also have citizens. But the Necrons, every single citizen was made into a soldier, so they have like trillions and trillions of stuff, and like every tomb world probably has billions of uh Necrons on it, type stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it's not bad. <laughs> Not but, quite Eldar level desperation. No, not not even close. They're they're nope. doing pretty well off, and maybe uh, Illuminor's Zeris can crack the code again and get some pariahs, which would be nice. But I really have no idea. The only rival to uh, the Stormlord though is Nemesor Zandrek, but he is loyal as can be, real nice guy. So Imhotep tolerates him. Moving on, though, is going to be Mister Zandrek and Oberon, the two fellows on the screen right now. My favorite. Uh, Necron characters by far. They are the best duo in 40k. Cannot be changed. My mind cannot be changed. And uh, yeah, Zandrek is the Nemesis of Gadrim, a world under Sawtech control. He is alongside Imhotep as one of the galaxy's greatest and most accomplished generals, as well as a grand historian. He even wrote some of the ancient manuals of war that the Necrons here possessed. Impossibly intelligent and full of witful bravado, he is a pristine noble who commands his troops with perfect efficiency. Despite this, he is taken with the madness that we mentioned earlier. Uh, this madness is like no other amongst his kind, it seems, although the a lot of Necrons are crazy. His is uh, kind of it's not the worst crazy you could have, and it doesn't hinder his abilities to lead, thankfully. But he believes himself to be still living in the times of the Necron tier. And he sees all the enemies as separatist dynasties. So whenever the Storm Lord commands him to go to battle, he phrases the enemy as uh, dynasties. Stubborn dynasties are space marines. Reckless dynasties are orcs, etc. Yet for all his lightheartedness, even Zandrak recognizes the Storm Lord's authority 
and it said royal instinct goes deeper than any engramatic damage uh so he sobers up quite quick when speaking to Imotech because sometimes when he's at his little feasts he uh convinces himself that he's drunk so he acts drunk which is pretty goofy <laughs> <laughs> it must be goes... pretty like pretty wild though for him where he's fighting an orc and then this orc is like a massively muscular you know beast thing yeah. and he's like that just looks like a really buff necron to yeah. him. or necron tear sorry to yeah, him. Much... been going to the gym where did he get these <laughs> jeez like he's going like oh my god who's the guy who's like was in the thing recently where he's definitely wasn't natty or something like that. Um, <laughs> the guy who used to eat liver king, he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he thinks Although he's fighting liver king. I can just imagine Zondrek fighting the crowd, just being like, "What the hell is even that? Look at these, yeah. these thin, tiny necrons. Ugh, oh, what are they doing?" It's not enough votes for Imotech in the chat. Very sad. Oh, oh man, I was just right. uh, I, go ahead, go ahead. I was just talking about. Uh, Zandrex condition. So if you were gonna mention more about that, I will not open my mouth. But uh, you, yeah, I, you can I talk say, about it. Isn't it okay. like it's also implied like he kind of like like dementia and like he'll come and go. Like it'll like it'll get stronger. Like and then it'll go for a little bit. Yeah, it like, seems I, to be. I feel like I think I read a passage where he's like, even if we were, you know undead skeleton mummies, which I don't believe at all. And I think I read like in the passage he somehow winked. Which mm. impressive. He's like, wouldn't it be <laughs> yeah. best just to, you know, make the most of it and enjoy this life of endless fun and campaigning? Yeah. Like it's I, like he does yeah. it comes and goes. How do you I wink with no eyelids? He know, he Tracy manages does it. Yeah. They use Tracy... like flicker of the of the ocular uh whatever's they're called. Oh, I think I think Trazen actually can form his body and <laughs> smiles and shit because he's, he's a good yeah. boy. That's creepy. Yeah. That's true, I think. Um, but yeah, I think so. I haven't finished a short story because I had already written too many notes, so I just stopped. Um, I but know as there... well those moments where he can also be in confidence with Oberon, like, oh, I'm not actually having moments of... Uh, oh, like, yeah, dementia. definitely. But then it's like, but are you? Are you Are you just having a lucid <laughs> moment and you're like, Haha, I'm not really suffering and yeah. it's like... Deadless for the star gods. That's far this moment, 101. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he... He flies his ship, uh, the carrying class tomb ship known as the Yama, which was his first successful campaign in the swamps of Yama. And this ship has very wonderful banqueting facilities. The ship is full of kitchens and sculleries with Necron commoners uh, actually who are meant to be tasters and cooks and the likes aimlessly wandering the halls with less consciousness than even warriors, which implies that warrior is not the only commoner class of Necron which I found interesting. It's always hard to tell, but I don't know. Xandrix seems to have some semblance of art left in him as well, which is very rare in the Necrons, especially they all suck at music. That's their worst thing, I think. But his grand chamber contains a ring-shaped table that is inlaid with mosaics of Xandrix's most famous victories. In each image, the oculars of the troops gleam with precious stones seized from the world they had conquered. It's pretty... He likes drama and art very much. Uh, to a being that could appreciate such things, the chamber would have been near indescribably beautiful, he said. Uh, and within this chamber, he celebrates victory, holding grand feasts of empty goblets and barren plates. But he thinks they're full of wine and food, of course. These times are often accompanied by his poetry, and he calls them epilogues, as all the lords that hate his guts to no, to no end have to spitefully sit there while he recites his poetry for hours and hours and hours oh my god uh, but... poetry slam but it's worse yeah. <laughs> you know what it it's like 12 of? years long you know what it reminds me of um when stalin was in charge of the soviet union apparently he used to watch cowboy films with his like advisors and they had to stay up till like four in the morning and watch them with him <laughs> Because if they didn't, it would be like, oh, yeah. you're going on the list, I'm getting you killed. So they had to be like, oh, and he'd be like, cowboy film? They're like, uh, uh. They, is this, they, is they... this it's like, is it Nemesis or Xander? Is this basically the death of Stalin, but then he doesn't die? Exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> death of Stalin. That's they, a they great do. film, by the way. Reminds me I never got to see it. I think Zhukov would really love Coca-Cola, but it was like the yeah. symbol of 
American capitalist American decadence capitalist. and, yeah. you know, the he, he Soviets. Got, um, a personal gift from, I think it was Eisenhower, he got, like, fish tackles from him as a gift, and he prized them for the rest of his life. He's yeah. like, ah, oh, he's a great man. I have I think, these fish tackles. I think he also gave him, like, clear Coke, so it's like, it's not Coke, yeah, it's just yeah. pure vodka. That's a very <laughs> Russian thing. <laughs> Nice. They have a slight uh, comment, which is, well, one, they're both very weird, but um, isn't they're not related? But I think it's quite interesting that for particularly for Necron tier and like Necrons, they didn't live long, even like for people who are listening, they didn't. They would die like a horrifically like cancerous death pretty early on in their lives. I think maybe they lived as, maybe as long as humans. It's, but then yeah, again, by like, the end was, of it, I think they lived. For a while, but yeah, compared they got, they to the mortal beings, I, I want to say like seventy. But then, yeah. like comparing humans now to like forty k humans, they've got rejuvenate, so they can live like hundreds yeah. of years. Yeah. But yeah. they didn't read really die of old age. For a neck yeah, because like uh, some were alive in the time of when the Silent King declared war on the old ones, and then they were still alive after the war and when they found the Catan, which which must yeah. have been like at least a hundred years, right? I think the, the, the interesting part is that for for basically a, a race that wouldn't live that long, it's interesting that they would even have time for things like art. So that's quite an interesting mm. sort of character development part there. <laughs> Although every uh, single piece is about death. It's just like, look at this Grim yeah. Reaper. He's like, yeah, yeah that's cool. The, yeah, the art, draw last week. Oh, I've got another Tombstone. Grim Reaper. How you mean? <laughs> like <laughs> the art was pretty much only to uh, further like royalty and show exuberance in that stuff. Uh, oh, my my other comment, which was. Uh, my favorite part is that there are some Necron, they have like Necron lords in, so in his like courtroom, he'd have the ones like, you know, master of war, master of armory or something. And there's still, there's still sometimes they have like master of grain yeah. <laughs> for a race yeah. that doesn't eat. And they're, so, they're from their old stuff. I yeah. know, but that's, so there's probably like some of the lords who hate him in that chamber. Oh like, yeah, all, all I'm of the master of, I'm like the master of you know pet grooming or something <laughs> yeah, even yeah. though we have yeah. no pets anymore oh. but like that you know oh my god they were like hating so much like i don't mm. need to be here <laughs> i'm the master of pedicures we don't have nails anymore <laughs> yeah my job's easy well, call what were you gonna say uh good question <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right fair uh, i don't know Sad. uh what I was just thinking was, I don't know, unfortunately, any, any of the Necron Lords who hate him have to get past a certain someone. Yes, they do. Yeah. Yes, they do, which we'll talk about soon. Uh, but yeah, all the Lords hate him, and they think that they should be the rightful rulers. And every time he goes out in campaign, they hope that it's the last one, then he, that he doesn't come back. So it's just salt in the wound that they have to then sit through hours of poetry and stuff. But they can speed up their chrono sense, at least, so that it goes faster. But Mr... Vargard Oberon obviously cannot speed up his sense because he has to be fully aware. So he has enjoyed millions of hours, it said, of talking to <laughs> Zandrek. <laughs> Andy, we saw that in the chat. There's summon the model. Yeah. I put that Dennett, there. The best <laughs> Dennett is the best character. He's a hero. Ripped in it. Was it a twice day king? People we hundred percent recommend reading that book. So good. Oh, I just did a small so spoiler, good. sorry. Don't worry about it. Um Sorry, I was in the chat. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Far worse than the lords that have to sit through this stuff are the enemy generals that he takes captive and then brings to these feasts. Oh uh, because it's honorable to take the enemy, you know, dynast, the enemy general captive instead of killing them until their ransom is paid uh, and treating them to a feast after a good battle. This usually includes imperial generals uh, who have soiled themselves with fear. Uh, with metallic ghouls speaking all around them in an incomprehensible language. In the short story, the one who was with them just dies out of fear. He just expires from being too scared, and his heart fails. <laughs> so that's Christ. fun. Uh, but he does take captives, which no other Necrons ever do. I think there is a story mm -hmm. with uh, like a white scar and some yeah, lady the, the master of the hunt, Corsaro Khan, gets captured, and then he tries to escape. He has a scrap with Oberon with the help from the Eldar Illic Nightspear. Ooh, and then Sandrake's like, I like this guy. You can go. And he's like, what? <laughs> he's like, you can go now. And he's like, I'm going to put your name in my record of the hunt, and I'll be back. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. Because you had like a dinner, a dinner with schmucks type of event with this guy. <laughs> oh, man. But uh, Zandrick, I think, is definitely the most unique and the most uh, he has the most personality of all the Necron lords, 
as he's one of the only ones who ever really sees seems to be expressing any joy and real happiness. Uh, when he meets up with an old friend whose previous beasts had been made into canoptics, the canoptics bound towards Zandrek, and he falls to the ground laughing and roughhousing them, uh, which is something Aww. not a single Necron noble would ever do. Uh, they would rather die than like be seen doing something like that. So he's still he's still pretty happy. I think he's living out of all yeah. the Necrons. He's probably the happiest guy. There was like a, a nice passage in one of the uh, Twice Dead King books where he, it's, it's when he's a Necron tier and he's just like, there was a guy called Zandrek and he was just being like a bit yeah, sarcastic and silly. And all and he's just there like grinning ear to ear with Oberon just <laughs> sat next to him. And all the Necrons like, I fucking hate that guy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> You'll have, all you just have a lovely smile, my friend. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, what a clown. Does he have a model? <laughs> or did, or did he ever have a model? Yeah, yeah he's dabbing. He's the dabbing guy. Yeah, he's got the yeah. dab model. Oh, yeah. He was he was in eighth and ninth edition. He's been here since fifth edition, and now he's just freaking gone for no yeah. reason. But whatever. Maybe he'll get a new model. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But oh, gone, but not forgotten. But he's extremely rip. honorable as well. Did you see say something called? I just said rip. Oh, okay. Yeah. Rip, he's rip, rip. yeah. Zandrick's probably also the most honorable Necron Lord, along with guys like uh, Anarch here. But he will abstain from things like bombing runs and using death marks because that's not in like the codes of yeah. honorable combat for the Necrons, which is pretty awesome if you ask me. He also ironically sees it as poor sport to field soulless machines um, on the field of battle. He made a comment when the Admech brought some robots to come fight him, and he was not very pleased about that. Obviously, he is a soulless machine, but he doesn't he doesn't know that, so it's okay. He often speaks to his lumbering Vargard Oberon, uh, yet expects little to no answers usually. Aubrey is more just there to listen and be someone to speak to as Zandrak reminisces and pours over his thoughts of strategy. Like I said, <laughs> millions of listener. hours. <laughs> yeah. He's he's a bit, he does speak sometimes though. He speaks a lot more than I would expect him to. Um but oftentimes it seems as if he's speaking nonsense and that it is uh he's in some grand trance of the past, but only for Oberyn to realize the goofiness had true meaning all along. Along with this, when the times arise uh, in war, when important when important moments come by, his authority and clarity are undeniable and implacable. We have another yes, uh, Colin. Do you want to read this one out? I think it's uh, oh good, oh good, you that's, here. that's good. Eldritch the Great Old One, thank you for the thank five, you, Colin. Thank would you go thank through you. bio transfers if you kept your mind? Your pancreas still wouldn't work, but you no longer need one. <laughs> Dude, if the Mechanicus was real, I would be bolting so much shit on my body, you wouldn't be able to tell where led to what. I would okay, absolutely right do that. I don't know. Basically waiting for the like cyberpunk. A... Dude, reality call me to David, because it. it's high time I chrome the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but I just had a Wake up Samurai. <laughs> a reference to the Phantom Pain uh, trailer and just Colin going. I can still feel my pancreas. It's my insulin. It doesn't have insulin still. <laughs> Why do we oh, suffer? Man. Why do we suffer? A little bit on that. I watched, this is, I guess it could be off topic. I watched Hardcore Henry for the first time the other day. That was awesome. A new, new literally me yeah. character dropped. If any, if you guys haven't seen Hardcore Henry, you should. Uh, it's a goofball. Oh, who's, uh, who's a South African guy? Who's like the main... Isn't he the South African I, actor I, I, who's um because he's in quite a lot of films like that where it's like a bit he's in um oh what's the one with like District Nine? Yeah, District Nine's the one he's also he's in. Like you know, with, with the prawns, mate, the prawns. <laughs> Fucking prawns. Yeah, Fucking yeah. prawns in South Africa. Ooh, yeah. I felt a little nauseous after that movie though, from all the freaking ooh, first yeah, person it, crazy it, stuff. But it, it was, was real fun. First person it is a bit like, oh, it's yeah. quite draining to watch. Such a goofy movie. But anyways, uh back to Xandra. At times uh, Oberon may almost be goaded into action and to leave the side of his master um, towards other threats that he sees, perceives as maybe important. But Jandrek always seems to catch when these threats are feints made to bring his Vargard away, so potential assassins can slay the general. In the short story, the Imperials Kamikaze a lifter close to Xandrek's command barge, bringing with it some Admech robots. Oberon requests that he may dispatch the newly arrived foe, but Xandra claims that the Lessers may deal with such unworthy foes who are the soulless robots, of course. A uh, small time after, an assassin appears, and Oberon realizes the attempted ploy, calling his leash's early remark another happy accident of nemesorial whimsy, but expecting quite the opposite. And at the end of the chapter, Xandra chuckles and asks, glad you stayed. 
making it all the more apparent that his eccentricities are often laced with genius. And he's, like we said earlier, he is probably more aware than he puts off to be. There have been moments when the Nemesaur faces reality, though, which we also said earlier, uh, when he was battling a severed world, which is a tomb world that uh, whose nobles were not waking up. So the autonomous spirit woke up all the Necrons and kind of is met going by itself, but it's like, like animal instinct Necrons kind of just to kill things. Um, but he sees the Necrons that they're that they've gone to fight against, and he sees them for what they are, and he says, "We're fighting us, but they're soulless." And he kind of freaks out and. Oberon scries into the ship because he Sandra stopped talking to him and he sees Sandra crying, he's weeping, which was like sheesh, but Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> That's tough. Uh, yeah. On a lighter note though, he does not realize he realize he himself is a machine. And there are times when he relies on Oberon to do things like see through smoke, even though Xandrek's eyes could see through a thousand different spectra. But he claims <laughs> that the Vargar's eyes are better than his own, his old eyes and yeah, he loves drama and theatrics, saying, what is Siege without a little theater and stuff like that. He's just a goofy guy. He's really fun. You can't not like you can't not like him. But on to the hmm. greatest bodyguard in the whole galaxy. Sorry, Nork D Dog. You're a G, but I gotta hmm. give it to Oberon. Uh Oberon is a hulking and menacing warrior who has served with Xandrek since his first campaign within the swamps of Yama after Xandrek graduated from the military academy and won his commission. The campaign was so successful that the Nemesaur was gifted Gidrum. This was in the time of flesh, and Oberon was born a soldier and was a veteran at the time. He was one of the first to wake up on Gidrum after the long sleep and immediately went to learning about everything that had transpired so that he may inform his master of the last 60 million years. Very loyal servant. He has unmatched reflexes and instincts with a reaction time of a thousandth of a second, which is insane. He is patient and in control of his emotions, usually not giving into excitement or anticipation, never striking or leaping to action before the correct moment. Uh, and if he is ever elsewhere when his lord is in danger, uh, his pristine and fancy arcane ghost walk mantle will get him right back to Xandric in the blink of an eye. It was created by Dagon, Grim Gidrim's greatest cryptech, and can tear through depths deeper than the interstices, which is what the Necrons use for normal translations. So when the interstices interstices are jammed he can still use the ghost walk mantle which is nice he's a extremely good duelist an efficient general because he often orders and commands the troops for the smaller things while xandrick just overwatched the whole thing and he's a skilled enough politician he is well versed in political ploys and assassination attempts as the other nobles constantly seek to rid themselves of xandrick in one instant a lord of gidrum attempted to deploy his death marks as a suspicious location, so Oberon accidentally overloaded the transports and destroyed them. But just like that, stuff like that, he's very, he's quite wily for just a far guard, and most, he takes a lot of lords by surprise with his, uh, well, sentience. But when he's necessary, he will also cover for the Nemesaur because he's charged to defend Xandrek's honor just as much as his physical form. He has been decorated seven times by the Order of the Tomb Fly whatever that is, and was gifted a sepulchral chamber larger than that of most minor lords. Along with this, he has his own personal phalanx of ten Lichgard who have survived thousands of campaigns. Many have been with him since Yama and were his friends. He still considers them as brothers. Uh, most of them die, though, unfortunately. But he's oh. not sad about it because he's... Oh. He, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, he sees it as they get to rest, which is what every Necron really wants. And they, As Lichgard, they're not really... They're only barely sentient, um, so they only understand little things, and they're, yeah, you, you know, it's yeah, a very sad meme, existence. Meme of the farmer going, it's not much, but it's honest work. Just yeah, the lich god. <laughs> <laughs> I did find out in the book though that uh, they, when they're faced with, they were fighting Canoptics, and they're unworthy foes, so the lich guard discarded their weapons and just killed them with their hands and feet because they weren't worth like using their blades for, which was. Neat little, neat little tidbit. <laughs> it's not worth the durability damage that I'm going to have to repair later. <laughs> I'll just pummel them now. <laughs> it would be dishonorable to use my weapon. Proceeds to beat the crap out of them <laughs> with fists. Yeah, uh, the phalanx guys also kept purposely kept their like scars and dents and stuff instead of letting them repair as you know signs of kind of their identity, which is nice. Aww. Oberon was once a stricter guy, but he's seen so many like heresies and transgressions that he doesn't really care anymore. Uh, but he only cares for his master's safety. 
But every so often, he entertains madness and imagines what things would be like without his master were slain. Or if his master were slain, sorry. Not having to hear the same stories or parables for the thousandth time. Not even not having to pretend to enjoy invisible wine and drink. But without Zendrick, he is not Oberon. So his duty persists. This is a this... big shout out to uh, Mr. DJ Beast here for, once again, thank you for telling us that Colin did make the bed this time. So that's uh, <laughs> we appreciate that as well. <laughs> oh, I got, we got a freaking bald joke. Eli doesn't have a widow's peak. It's more of a widow spire. She did a lot. Man delivering precious Necron Lord Lord. <laughs> and you do his hairline like that. Oh my gosh. You? Bro, I'll you come shave to the, it. the forehead soon. gang over here. You leave my boy alone. You leave him out of this. <laughs> Listen, you've, this is a strong forehead group, okay? <laughs> Back off. Oh, man. The, the camera angle definitely doesn't help. But that's <laughs> funny. Oh, my gosh. There, I miss... If you're watching this guy who used to comment bald jokes on, like, all my videos, I miss you. He would... <laughs> <laughs> he would comment this, like... Oh, man, it's like, like, with the jeans the other calls video or post he'd be like that gene sealer has more hair than you or something like that <laughs> and uh, like stuff like that and i sent it to my friends and they freaking loved it i think that's but... what's called an abusive relationship <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate oh, the man. mild abuse but we don't <laughs> want it that much oh, i gotta go through reanimation protocols for that yeah for real dude uh, but anyways back to back to oberon uh, his skill with the blade is completely unmatched um and i've yet to see or hear a anything uh, i would have to hear of him lose any duels that he's fought he's slain seven Kaladis assassins easily which was Jeez. pretty baller uh and it shows a still like his master his thing is rubbed off on him he shows a display of dramaticism in the story where the assassin is creeping closer unaware of oberon's uh being able to see her she thinks he's undetected but oberon found her a long time ago uh, but he's resigned he's responding to xandrek's wonderings as the assassin's creeping closer to Xandric, and he says, uh, let them commit, my lord, he said, because Xandric was asking uh, Oberon what he thinks the enemy for what they should do by the enemy forces. Uh, so he says, let them commit, my lord, in a, his doleful husk of a voice, let them feel victories within reach, then take everything from them. Then the assassin's head snapped around at the sound of Oberon's voice, and he exploded forward, swore sleep, sweeping in a wide arc. Pretty epic. And while the assassin fight is going on, Xandric is still pondering, not even seemingly aware of the battle, bringing up a rhyme in response to Oberon's previous answers. Take a drubbing, let them advance, wait for the moment, seize your chance. And he then senses an imbalance and pins the Kalidus to the ground, defeating her. Oberon can pick out things in combat that likely space marines, even space marines could not, even highly advanced machines I assume could not. He can spot the tiniest little imbalances and capitalize off of them in an instant with a speed unlike the rest of his race. He also knows many ancient blade techniques, demonstrating one known as the Spearfisher's Poise, which implies the Necron Tear had some form of blade traditions. More cool little history. He can slow his chronosense and maximize divination algorithms to fight like a god. Uh, his words, but only for a time, as it will burn away Ingrams and take away himself. Uh, in one moment in the story, Along with the things mentioned earlier, he converts half his energy to mass and rockets through the teeming hordes of warriors to soar through the air, bellowing Xandrek's name and plunging his scythe into the enemy lord's chest. And that was pretty awesome. This costs like, him. Xandrek! Yeah. Like, what the hell is that? You see him barreling towards you, like, what is that thing? <laughs> so he actually has like the ability to go, I'm the juggernaut bitch, and just run in. Yeah. <laughs> Like yeah. he has a li he has a literal version of that. <laughs> yeah, yes, he took half of reference. his the energy from his core flux and he converted it into mass, which like pushed him forwards basically in momentum, which is pretty cool. We have a donation again from the Eldritch, the old great one. Thank you, thank my you, friend. brother. Thank you. May I propose a trade deal? <laughs> Eli gets Colin's hairline and Colin gets his pancreas. <laughs> Bro, <I'm, laughs> I don't think I'm gaining much there, buddy. <laughs> no, come on. That's a, that's a good, oh, that's, no. that's a good oh, one. Geez. Promise, bro. Uh, I'm good for it. Oh, man. And yeah, I need to melt the mask to bit. the face like the Antioch. Anyway. Sheesh. There we go. That'd be a scary, a scary Andy <laughs> arc. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But doing that cost him the name of his father and his sense of taste a small price to pay in his opinion i could go on longer about these guys but i decided that i should stop because we don't have all day and we have more <laughs> doom kings to talk about so i will go through the other main guys which is anarchy or trazen orkin cesaris 
and then how we'll talk about uh Cesar Rec, the Silent King. Mm. And then Andy might have a little bit to say on old text if he's feeling like it, if we have time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Andy also knows about a bunch of weird little obscure guys. So he might, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, next we are gonna talk about Andrew Kier the Traveler, my other favorite character who was also Yoinks from the Codex, even though his model was pretty awesome. It's very large Andrew, and cool. Man. And he's oh, blue. Yeah. He's freaking blue. You can't, oh, whatever. What can you do? <laughs> My friend just uh, bought him before the codex dropped because uh, he wanted to play him against me. And then now he can't. So. Feels bad. I mean, he's still, he the, can, yeah. I appreciate the picture, Andy. <laughs> and the model doesn't glue together can, very well either. It's like, ah. Uh, he, can, he can still play uh, with him. He just has to use the legends rules, which is mm. sad, but. If you're just playing friendly games, you can still technically play. But it means that he won't be in the 11th edition codex unless he is given a new model. But he did have two like little tiny short story in the codex though, for like two pages. So that you know gives me some hope. But anyways, he's Anakir the Traveler. He's Overlord of Pyria, which is in the Mephred Dynasty, and he has the sole divine cause of uniting the Necron Dynasty to return them to their former glory. He has no care for politics or personal power, only for the betterment of his people. He is the greatest Necron noble to ever live, um, as in these, at least in these times, as he has sacrificed all luxury and gain just for his people. But other lords hate him and see him as a brigand because Anarchy is constantly going to the aid of Tomb Worlds, awakening them and slaughtering any vermin that may be upon its surface. And after he does this, he demands a tithe from these forces so that he may continue his great journey. These reinforcements are very necessary as his troops have been battling for eons, literally, and need constant replenishment. Those who refuse, he simply takes from. Uh, Anarchir is well-versed in politics and extremely skilled in the courtly environment, so he can often negotiate what he needs. But he's a freaking G, dude. He has the ability to extend his mind into enemy machines and strangle the machine spirit, bending them to its will. And in this way, the enemy guns will often turn on their own forces, and chaos ensues. He is accompanied by his immortals, the Pyrian Eternals, who are ruthless warriors with thousands of years of experience. And despite their lack of higher consciousness and higher self, they are still hardened veterans, and they are loyal to the very end. In recent times, Anarchy has done a few baller things, like kill the Silver Skulls chapter master, do a little trolling. I did a little trolling to the Tau as well, because he destroyed a high fleet who were is about to invade a Tau colony, but that Tau colony happened to be on a uh, Necron tomb world. So he went down to the colony, and the Tau were rejoicing and like congratulating him, and so excited. But then he just killed them all because like he doesn't he doesn't care. Uh, and he later fought. Oh, sorry, we have a, we have another. Oh, another donation. Donation. That's the word from Eldritch. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Brother. I know I poke fun at y'all, but I love your guys' content. I hope you only get more success in the future. IDK any group is more chill than y'all. Oh, thank you. Thank you, we brother. Appreciate it. We do. We're all just here to chill out, relax. If you guys are listening away or painting or stuff like that, just paint paint one for the boys right now. Yeah. <laughs> paint it for the boys. Paint yeah. one out for the boys. That's it. <laughs> paint one out for the boys. Am I right? <laughs> there also seems to be a a big battle that happened, which I would need to read about somewhere, where Trays and Orc and uh, Zandrik. Stormlord and Anarchy were all a part of it, and it was against the Lay Talk. Um, at least I think the Stormlord and Xandric were there. Forces from Mandragora and Gidrim were there, so they probably were. But it was against the Lay Talk and some Exodites, and Orkin or Anarchy uses Orkin to out Farseer the Farseer and mess with their prophecy, uh, and ends up taking the W. And he's also worked with Caesaris before. He was the best, best skirt in all of the Necron. Uh, line as well. His little model actually has like sort of like a skirting effect. So yeah. I always thought he was a little bit of a nice kilt influence there. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he probably sounds Scottish or anything <laughs> like that. He's cool. I miss him. I miss him, bros. It's shame they moved from the travel with as well. me. Come on, then. That's what he sounds like canonically. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think GW did remove the, like him and a lot of the lords <sighs> from the codex? Though? They want they want to make Who new knows? models, I guess, but because they're their old models, maybe like I, I, I really don't know. But <laughs> is it to do with streamlining tenth edition? They're like, we want to get rid of these weird characters and redo them completely because maybe I feel like they were like, be. oh, we kind of want the Necrons to do one thing, and there's too much weird stuff, so we need to pull them back and rethink it. Mm. 
Or it may be like, again, like they don't want to make, because I like get for GW, in all fairness, there's so many characters and models in the line that getting around to make, even like making new ones is quite difficult. So maybe p- perhaps pulling older ones that they can well, really release like, a, oh, it's 11th yeah. edition. And then you go, guess what comes with your codex? A new or revamped. Yeah. Yeah, but oh, I do you know there is the conspiracy theory that uh, most of the new models they release they've had for like years and years. Someone told me that that's why the striking scorpions were so mid because they probably made them like five years ago. But I don't know, I three don't know. years ahead, they said, didn't they say, like for the people who work in the um, modeling department, they, they make the model at least three years ahead of hmm. release. So then, jeez. Well, yeah, it makes sense because I remember. I think it was chat to master Valrak at the time. It was ages ago. And he was saying he had like a, it was again, like a rumor thing that they're going to be good. World eaters will be coming to ninth edition at the end. Mm. And this was like early night. So they weren't even out. Like no one even said anything. And then again, like that was because they said they'd already made the sculpts for it ages ago. And obviously again, there's been a faction uh, release of world eaters at the end of ninth. So I think, yeah, they probably made all these models now i wonder mm. which ones they've hopefully made already <laughs> and they'll be like yeah. i just can't wait come on i don't know it makes me sad though but what can you do or they yeah. just don't want to make any more of the model so they would just want to get rid of inventory and then um, is not it also a case of, it, of but... they've got these new models for like emotech and stuff they're like we want you to buy this yeah that we're is gonna get rid of the old the stuff we want you to play these at the tournament so that more people go that's a cool model and they buy this yeah. rather than the weird blue guy i bought Imotech for my friend who i'm gonna like paint up for him because he's got he nice. plays necrons and his dynasty are um i think he wasn't he's not playing a particular dynasty but his like uh paint scheme is a nice like kind of properly nice gold mm-hmm. like a nice like, sort of subtly like red gold <laughs> tint and he has like orange highlights. I'm going to try and hopefully paint Imitech up. But it's this so it's delayed in shipping for so long because uh, it's so hard to get an Imitech at the moment. Dang. Oh, pain. Oh we my god, another, another dono. Yeah, you can. Uh, be... That one's by um, Elliot Horps. Thank you, brother. He says, "Hey, Law hey. Crimes. I won a box of heavy intercessors at a tournament, and I'm nice. converting them into eradicators with nice. melter and flame bits from the guard. Nice. I did the nice. similar thing with eradicators. I I want. I needed more eradicators, but I didn't want to buy more models, so I just converted <laughs> up and I just said, "These are Raven Guard ones, so they're wearing Phobos armor." But, you know, <laughs> but they're, they're eradicators, one hundred percent. I swear, mm. that's a good, uh, good choice there, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, but sorry, continue, Eli. Yeah, that's right. We're <laughs> moving on swiftly now for the last uh, last three fellows. We have Trays in the Infinite, who I think is most people's favorite. He's mm. the Grand Archivist of Solemnness. And... <laughs> and he's doing picture drawings for the uh, audio listeners. I've done all Very of them. Nice. <laughs> and he's been drawing nice. um, them on post-it notes, if you're listening on like Spotify or anything like that. Mm. And I th- I think most of us know Trazen's story for the most part. And uh, we are going to go over Infinite in the Divine in a future episode. So I'm not going to like go too into it. But uh, Trazen is an eclectic, wacky, eccentric of the Necrons who's generally hated by all of them because he's such a weirdo and he just uh, he doesn't fit into the whole uh i don't know how to explain it archetype yeah then he's not all obsessed with royalty and stuff yeah. like that and he's he's kind of like uh how anarchy is i guess but a but a goofball instead of like a noble noble cause type of guy but i mean his cause is noble in his opinion he is he holds ga- galleries upon solemnness that contain the galaxy's history and he wishes to preserve the galaxy and all of its history um, but I think some people say it's just because he's obsessed with having stuff. So I'll let you decide. But the I just got the quick wiki list for what he has in his museum, and I'll read it off because might as well. So according to that, he has a Wraithbone Choir, the head of Sebastian Thor, the ossified husk of an enslaver, brother Cassie of the Blood Angels, one of the shrines that had contained the world spirit of Karnak. Oh, feels bad. Several regiments of Katachan jungle fighters, a device containing the entire high fleet that launched the Tyranid invasion of the world of viewers, which Trazen himself had sparked in an effort to add a Tyranid exhibit to his collection. Jesus. Of course, Lieutenant Commander uh, Sarantes of the Ultramarines Legion, his battle brothers, and several Contemptor Patent Dreadnoughts from the time of the Horus Heresy, and Adeptus Custodes, several regiments of the Vestorian Firstborn. Bring those guys back to GW, please, I'm begging you. The Lost Regiments from Tanith, 
Astartes of the Salamanders chapter, the Last Lord, Castlin of Cadia, Ursarker E. Creed, never forget, Inquisitor Greyfax, I didn't know that he had her, a uh, perfect clone of the Primarch Fulgrim. <sighs> <laughs> dead and they're not gonna do anything Al- with that by the way they're nope, not gonna do no, they're not. With it. i know they're not and it's so painful uh he is an ancient yeah uh, an ancient eldari uh kind of like warrior who fought in the war in heaven pretty cool a 12 meter tall crook who also fought in the war in heaven and numerous ancient necrontier pots smoking pipes and walking sticks including the one Trazen had used when he still had an organic body Sorry, holy cow. We have a donation from Tom Warren. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Nice to see you. What cause could be more noble than stealing everything cool that's ever existed? Amen. <laughs> Fair. We love him for it. What's the name for it? Something Coleptic, isn't it? Or um, Kleptomania. 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 <laughs> or the, uh, you know, as Belisarius would say, Abomination. Yes, he yeah. is. Uh, he's he's a historian. <laughs> My favorite thing about my favorite, <laughs> it's basically Indiana Jones, but crippled and old, but in an immortal <laughs> body. Yep. Um, yeah. I, I do a, Notre Dame with Indiana Jones. <laughs> I do have a favorite sort of fact about Trojan, which is that he doesn't really like the Imperium, but not for the reasons everyone thinks. It's because the when the Imperium sort of conquered the galaxy, it basically made everything else Imperium. So all like the little diverse little pieces he could add to his museum all got basically colonialized into imperial stuff so he's like mm. oh you ruined my you know <laughs> you've gentrified my galaxy <laughs> yeah. you gentrified was, my like, galaxy the opening of the infant vine is like god they're so boring <laughs> we got a pine cone yeah. on screen baby that's a traffic what <laughs> <laughs> pine, pine cone, cone? <laughs> you that, a pine cone uh, it's a cone Pine All right. Do you eat ice cream? You're like, man, that's a delicious pine cone. Like, what? <laughs> is it like a uh, local, is this like, the first, first word that came to mind? I don't know what to say. Just... Like in, is it everyone? If anyone here is like from South Africa, don't they call um, traffic lights robots? Do they? I think they, they call them yeah. them robots. Like you know, watch out for the robots. Intelligence. <laughs> Not the abominable traffic light. <laughs> Jeez, nah. I, All right. we, we will talk about Trazen a lot in the future though, when we get yeah. to that uh, video, still have a, it's so good. I still have a little bit on him. I have, so we can talk about his war gear, because it's pretty unique. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. His greatest weapon is the Empathic Obliterator, and this relic dates back to the times of the Old Ones, and has the potential for incredible destruction. It has the ability to destroy entire squads of infantry with a single blow. As the Obliterator uses otherworldly technology to send out a psionic shockwaves, staying true to its name, and obliterating any similar beings within the vicinity. In this way, he need only spend minimal energy and time to reduce droves of enemies to mush. His Time Splinter Cloak allows him to view the currents of time, making split decisions to weave through their currents and avoid attacks with ease. He stole it from someone. I don't remember who, though. And the most terrifying weapon in his arsenal are that of the Mind Shackle Scarabs, as these little constructs oh. will burrow into the desired target's mind and take full control. Using these, Trazen can turn any he needs to his side so that they may assist him in his works. We'll talk about that in the future, too, I'm sure. And he is known as the Infinite for his use of surrogate hosts, leaping his consciousness from one Necron to another and creating multiple bodies for such consciousness to travel. And in this way, he will likely never truly die. Next up is his best buddy rival, Orkin, who is the Necron's greatest astromancer and chief seer. <laughs> he is a cryptech of sublime skill, who can read the skies of fate through great algorithmic casting and star reading. He is also a skilled chronomancer, able to reverse time, playing things over and over again as he enacts zodiacs until he gets it right. This also makes him almost impossible to pin down in combat as well, although he is not generally one to fight. He is less of a general and more of a wandering researcher, similar to most cryptex, but his future sight does make him a very good commander, as he generally almost always knows what the commander is going to do next, uh, and what, what the enemy is going to do. Sorry. So he can predict that. everything that the enemy is going to do. <laughs> but regardless, he doesn't fight too often. He's a very uh, relentless fellow, though. He'll he'll keep trying for thousands of years, <laughs> as we will talk about you know, Infinite and Divine. You know what? The, I, when I think of the Necron Lords, I think of the East in particular. It's like you got all the, you got like Emotech and Sarek. They're like the jocks and everything. And then Trazin <laughs> and Orokin are like, 
one's from the chess club and one's from the yeah. math club. <laughs> like they're both the nerds of the guy. They're like, oh, they're the guys as they're doing their own thing and they're just bickering to say, I'm I'm smarter than you are. And it's just like, ah. <laughs> That's yeah, because Anthony says Orkin feels like an incel. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I mean, he does kind of. Oh, dear. Eli said pinecone, my fear and hunger brain got into overdrive. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, yeah. But, anyways, Orkin's ultimate goal um, was, is similar to Caesar's, is that he wishes to achieve a godlike form of pure energy that would rival that of the power of the Catan. And when the stars align and his divination succeed, he may find this great power and become unstoppable for a time. He has predicted nearly every major event of the galaxy and has and was paramount in guiding the Necrons in the great sleep. And before this, though, he tried really hard to get them to not uh, go into biotransference. And he told them that the Katan were going to betray them and because he, he saw what was going to happen, but nobody believed him. Only, was like that. only one to speak out against it was it. like that scene mm. in halo 4 when the guy's like arrest this man arrest <laughs> him and that was our king just going like no don't do it mm. <laughs> yep oh uh, i uh i don't know if what his rules are like on the tabletop i i meant to check because i have the codex but i forgot to because back in the day in like fifth edition um you would roll a dice on all the turns and if you got the right roll he would uh, achieve his like final form thing and his stats yeah. would be super big but i'm not sure if they have something cool like that anymore but his new model is pretty cool as well it fair. is it is they did that one justice and it looks like utterly unique compared yes, to he does. any other necron lord so big uh, life bigger of a head yeah <laughs> he's getting the water hill float <laughs> that is what i like about the necrons because they do have some individuality still amongst amongst the nobles at least um generally their personalities and how they lived transferred over to biotransference and kind of made them look how they look which is cool yeah i mean the, the three that stand out wrong you like seras for big spindly legs you've got mm. trazim with his hunchback and then you've got orican with his big head um it's just yeah you, i feel i suppose for like a really good necron design you have to make it like over the top like we need to make mm -hmm. him really obviously different otherwise it's yeah. difficult to see the little details oh, for, yeah dj beast reminds me that uh the infant in the divine book is Half of it is just orc and simping over the cryptech lady. Yep. <laughs> the other half is him and Trazen's sexless, sexless marriage. <laughs> Jeez. They were trying to All go right. to like, they were basically trying to do a grave robbing, you know, Nefra's mm. tomb, Nefra's <laughs> tomb. <laughs> the... Type oh, the... Yeah, we got, we got no spoilers, no spoilers. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, last on our list today is Illuminor Caesaris. Um and I haven't I have not actually watched Pariah Nexus, so if there's things that you guys want to add after this, uh feel free. I feel bad for not watching Yeah, he's it, actually but... in a official GW animation. So yeah. you can if you're listening to this, you can go actually check him out on mm. well, obviously Warhammer Plus technically, but it's definitely yeah. reposted to YouTube for free. I need to find those <laughs> those nice reposts. I've been lacking because it looks really cool. But anywho, Caesaris is the Necron's very own mad scientist. He is a complete and absolute genius uh, akin to other crazy guys like Fabius and Call. Probably more like Fabius, though, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. As Eesh. I mentioned a little bit earlier, his ultimate goal is to achieve a form similar to the Catan, as he has ever believed that his race has been on the path of ultimate evolution. He aided greatly in biotransference, making it possible with the great and terrible furnaces, as he believed it to be just another step on this ultimate journey. He is constantly researching, but unlike other Necrons, has no qualms with touching flesh. In fact, the large majority of his research is done on living beings. Um, he wishes to unlock the secrets of life, so of course, dead things won't help much with that. So these poor fellas these poor test subjects are kept alive by the arcane technologies of the necrons through literally unimaginable experiments like not i'm sure our worst nightmares couldn't even come close to what this freaking guy does could you but, quickly explain the whole because he's the only one who will touch flesh can you explain why the others won't eli it's <laughs> uh they'll, amongst, they'll love this yeah well, amongst necron royalty it's seen as taboo generally um for one reason or another because they just hate flesh but also because they are scared of getting the flare curse so if you touch flesh it could you know trigger thoughts like that but it's mostly just like don't touch the vermin flesh that's disgusting that's taboo like if you touch flesh as a necron lord uh the servants 
whose fault it was is put to death immediately. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't yeah. stuff it's like that. Good, I don't know if that was the answer you're looking for. A, a good, no, no, that's right. Yeah. A good parallel I think is good is when you were like seven or eight and you're like, ooh, girls, don't touch girls. Ew, yeah. It's like <laughs> that flesh. <laughs> the, the flesh is the flesh is unclean. The, the flesh uh, is grody. Yeah. The Necrons are probably more are they are more xenophobic. So they are more xenophobic than the Imperium, for sure, I think, because they see and every that's single. A high <laughs> yeah, they. Well, I, I think they make the Imperium look like nice guys because, like, the Imperium will at least generally talk to like Tau and Eldor and work with them sometimes. But yeah. the Necrons see everyone else as like unclean vermin who should all be genocided and destroyed and killed. So that yeah. does remind me of the fact that it, it's a small part of the, tr the Infinite and Divine, but it's just a very small segment of when the humans settle on one of the old Eldari worlds and then Trazen translates like the Eldari building that they've built around and it's a sewer. <laughs> it's an Eldar <laughs> sewer. And then they go, and he's like, Lidgy, his whole thing's like shivy, like, oh, that's disgusting. Because mm -hmm. the, yeah. the idea of them like touching anything like waste or human or like even blood, yeah. they're like, Lidgy, like, oh, yuck, you've touched flesh. Even, even in the Necron tier days, they hated plumbing and uh, excrement and stuff. Um, yeah, and that, that was what you'd be about it. Yeah, that, that's what you'd be put to death. <laughs> Meanwhile, for. on Ultramar, they've got like the vinegar sponge on a stick. And they're like, What's the problem, guys? <laughs> oh man, yeah, it's the it's yeah. the communal ultramarine, you know, shit stick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's the ultra because it's got an Ultramar symbol on it. <laughs> but the uh, Ultramar yeah. sponge. Oh man, I well maybe more on that another day, I guess. Uh, but I'll be making a big Necrons video soon. I feel like I know way too much about these guys but that any, anyways uh, to back to the shout out to who? favorite line in the infinite vine you stupid bastard you got his <laughs> box seeds to a coup <laughs> <laughs> so awesome it's a good book you should all read it all, all the necron books are good honestly maybe the one with kato sakarius is pretty mid but you know that's to be expected because we all know what happens when Kato Sakari is there. Guy 1v1's a monolith and freaking wins, but, you know, it's, it doesn't matter. It, do, it doesn't matter. Oh, where, where where was I? Was Mr. Ceres. Ah, yeah. These, the poor test subjects are being kept alive through unimaginable experience uh, experiments, which are like, for sure, I can guarantee they're worse than the stuff Fabius does, because at least you'll probably eventually die when you're with Fabius. But the people who are with Ceres, he keeps, along, he keeps alive for a while quite a while you could be in there for years getting freaking amputated and worked on and stuff and just ugh, horrible uh and but when their screams get too annoying he'll just turn off his audio transducers and you know doesn't care with the many secrets uh, that his research has unlocked he applies to his legions and other nobles armies for a price of course this is blasphemy to an insane degree but Zaris doesn't really care and he often takes Xenos biology and integrates it into his armies. Not like putting eyeballs into Necron warriors and stuff, but like researching an eyeball and taking patterns and stuff from that and then upgrading his guys to have similar patterns to the Xenos eyeball. Things like that. Uh, he's also said to create pariahs, which have been kind of retconned and messed around with, but they haven't been, a, they weren't like officially retconned. They still kind of are in the mm -hmm. lore sort of but it's hard to tell but pariahs were essentially in the third edition necron stuff uh human blanks who would then be put through biotransference they would still have some of their organs ooh, excuse me in their body but they gave off the blank aura which made them very strong because they had necrodermis bodies still as well um and rumors say that caesarus either planted the pariah gene in humanity because some people think that the necrons put the pariah gene in humanity so that when they wake up in 60 million years, they'll have a tool to, you, to use against the Eldar and against Psykers. Um, some people say that he tampered with the DNA and genes of the Kalexis assassin temple, the Null guys. That is the right one, right? I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. Yeah, and he supposedly gave some of them like sleeper agent genes to eventually wake up and go to his tomb world, essentially. Uh, but He's also done the Pariah Nexus stuff, and that has Pariah in the name. So I I don't really know what happened with all of it, but it's there. If anyone knows the particular lore, if there's uh, anything important. The, the work he's doing with the Pariah Nexus is he's, like, trying to find a way to get them back into, like, fleshy bodies. So that's, mm -hmm. like, 
Sarex, like, my man, I need you to work on your project to make us back into skin bags. And he's like, yeah, gotcha. Going to have to catch some humans, do some experiments, and it's not going great. Uh, Prior Nexus show is only like three episodes, so it's not very long. It's like an hour. Mm. Um, He's doing some experiments. That's kind of it. There's (laughs) there's like not any real plot to it. Well, there's no lore to it. I know they're doing another spin-off with Sakan, who's the salamander in the series. Because uh, mm. he does a stare down with Seras, and he's like, "Intriguing, you are a worthless human." Lol, and he just, and he, he has this whole thing about like, he gets a death mark to try and assassinate him, and there's a point where he, he does like a, a parallel to like the afterlife and religion. He's like, he has like this head twitch. He's like, "Do not use such unscientific terms around me." Mm, like, that's All right, where the memes from edgy atheist. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> But yeah, that's that's the main Necron Lords. I don't know if I forgot anybody. I'm pretty sure I didn't. Uh, we can Silent holy King. cow from Anthony. Uh, oh my god, paying for college. Anthony. Thank you, love you, brother. Holy cow, for a hundred dollars. Thank you. Um, as someone who just bought the Old World Tomb King box, yes, and also has Necrons. Good taste. Yeah, I can't decide which of them is more petty. <laughs> Uh, but then I remember the Bretonia right. episode, and remember it's neither. Uh, then, in fact, Colin is the pettiest one. <laughs> nice. Always a pleasure to catch you alive. Thank you. Bless you, Thank brother. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate I'm, just, it. I'm glad this episode has become the let's all take sh- pot shots at Colin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to uh, go at right. hairlines, faces, <laughs> things that don't work 100%. Oh, yeah. Everyone's catching the strays. Well, it's a good time. We very much appreciate it. You guys Oof. keep us you guys keep us fed and alive. So yes, Aye. thank you yes. so much. What about the right. man himself? Ah yeah. That's <laughs> I will uh, take over for sure the last is, little... sure is art. <laughs> for, for reference. And Oberon. Andy has yeah. done for all of this. Really like he's you. drawn little pictures of all the <laughs> Necron lords uh, we've been talking about. Um uh, but... Emotic giving the bird. <laughs> <laughs> But having said that, though, we're going to speak about Zarek, the Silent King. And unfortunately, as much as he's like technically the leader of all the Necrons, he doesn't actually have that much lore, which is kind of annoying. Yeah. Although he is a pretty sick tabletop model. And um, it goes so cool. It does. He got big throne, big throne go hard. And uh, he's, yeah, he's sort of around, but he doesn't, unfortunately, he doesn't have quite as much personality as the rest of these uh, boys. But his law is essentially like quiet. he is. Yeah, he doesn't. <laughs> well, we're going to get into that. Yeah. So he is Zarek of the Zarekin dynasty, perhaps the only one who has like one named after him. Um, or maybe not named after him, but named after his. Oh, he's named after the dynasty. We're not really sure. Um, but he's also known as the Silent King because, as we probably might have all guessed, the Silent King is quite silent. He actually doesn't communicate with um anyone he's talking to he kind of whispers slightly to his triarch council which you'll notice on his model the ones who kind of sit like either side of him they kind of like the slot the basically like the bitches of the throne they sort of sit there and look intimidating but they just have to do what he says and zarek is famous because as much as in necron history um a lot of like the necron lords like the, diff- the different dynasties would take over being a silent king and the last one would be Zarek himself, and he'd be the one who agreed to essentially the Catan's deal of the biotransference, which, again, was a bit of a goof up because it kind of enslaved his people, murdered all of the Necron tier, and turned them into the Necrons, and so there's never going to be a new Necron, and they basically were enslaved to the Catan for the massive war in heaven where they fought the Old Ones, the Eldar, the Krork, probably some... Probably some aliens hey. that we've never hey. heard of. We won. <laughs> we we saw, we 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 represented in the end though. Um, but it wasn't like the Super Bowl, so we couldn't keep coming back every year and trying again. You know, this is like one big, big old war. And unfortunately, it just it just went poorly. And he kind of he was given like the command protocol to. Uh, he basically was pretty much the slave master of all of the Necrons, and. He basically couldn't fight against the Katan because they were so powerful. Eventually, the War in Heaven did sort of reach a point where the Old Ones were basically defeated and the Katan were starting to battle themselves. Thank you, Kegarak, I believe, who tricked them into fighting themselves and eating each other. The first and of many Eldar dubs. The first yeah. of many. The first of the million-year rule of the Eldari after this. 
Um, but this eventually triggered um, Zarek to go with like a plan he'd been working on forever. He had built, he'd asked, and secretly in you know packs with other like Necrons, he built machines and weapons that even to this day they will not touch. I think one of them is owned by Illuminator Zarek. Oh, what's his name? Sorry, Zarek? Not Zarek. Um, Cesares. Cesares. Cesarek and Cesares are. He gave him like a weapon where like it's like a a map of the galaxy, but if he touches it, it basically interferes with oh, the galaxy. See. Yeah, I can't remember which dynasty has that. Yeah, but it's just like if you just go even boop, then yeah, that even sun he goes won't supernova. mess with that. And even um Zarek the Silent King says they used weapons that fundamentally broke the galaxy or maybe like ruined the you know, pro- possibly <laughs> led to the creation of the chaos gods apparently in recent law was a thing and uh, they essentially broke the katana shards um then they were just basically stuck in a power vacuum and he released his protocol so he wasn't controlling them but then the eldari were basically on the rapid you know climb up because the eldari could make more eldari whereas the necrons were finite so they went to the you know the big sleep which is famous in necron um, law and uh, Zarek didn't sleep though. Zarek basically had insomnia. He couldn't deal with the guilt. Um, different kind of insomnia. He went on a very long gap. Here. And I do believe this might be <laughs> Colin's favorite fact is when he was um, he went to go travel outside of the galaxy. But Colin, what brought him back? Do you? I think you remember this tidbit. Ah, I do. Yes. Uh, would you like me to kind of take <laughs> yes. over for a moment here. Yes. Well, you see, uh, in his you know self-imposed exile, who just you know floating outside the Milky Way galaxy is as one does, when he uh, he bumped into a, a little something known as the Tyranid Hive Fleets. Cheeky. So, you know, Ooh, a, a slight little something. traffic jam. <laughs> uh, and he came back uh, with the most revelatory you know, piece of information the galaxy had ever seen. He came back to warn the galaxy that the Tyranids are, in fact, a problem. Uh, something that truly understatement, yeah. no <laughs> one had realized up to that point. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and, while uh, Tech was like, I want to kill all the orcs because they're annoying. Charles and um, Sarah was just like, um, they're more than annoying. They're they're going to doom the entire galaxy. It's, I'd also I... like to shout out Tom Warren for the two dollar donation. Funny message. Oh, thank you, Tom. He, he says Colin is my third favorite diabetic person. I just Yo, who's number two and one? <laughs> I don't know who the, t- I don't know who the first you are. Colin is my second favorite slot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I want to know who your first star for these. I was on your okay. Discord, Colin, and the amount of people who say slop <laughs> is ridiculous. It's because I make slop. <laughs> I'm making the fucking What can slop? we say? It's a sloppy Discord. Oh, anyway. Sloppy Discord. <laughs> Jesus. So Zarek is sort of returned. The only thing that brought him back was the tyranny of threat, because... The Tyranids are, in a way, quite similar, where, like, old Necron lore, they devour... They both sort of eradicate all life, but essentially, I think what's brought Zarek back was the fact that they waited... They did the big sleep because they wanted the galaxy to heal so then the Necrons could rule, rule over it. But there's going to be no galaxy to rule if it's all been devoured and broken apart yeah, by the and Tyranids. not only that, if they want to go back to having, like, bodies... They need experiments. They need stuff to like harvest to be like, like let's do some stuff to see, see if we can actually become, you know, Necron tier again. If it's all been nommed by the Tyranids, like we're gonna turn these in. No, we're not, I'm not going in that thing. That mm. insect, ugh, bugs. Ugh. Yeah, it's so work. in a weird way, they both they're sort of like rivals, which is quite interesting. But um, Zarek is only re- again they don't see the Imperium as a threat, which is funny because <laughs> like. Or even chaos as a threat, which they're very aware of chaos uh, existing in this time. But the tyrannies are the threat when which Zarek actually feels is a, you know, that could be a real problem. And interesting enough, there is a tidbit um, in sort, it's only the really time he showed up in any like proper written law in like novel form or novellas or short stories when he meets Dante of the Blood Angels. Uh, it's on a world where the Necrons and the blood angels are fighting and then suddenly the necrons stop and the the blood angels like in the middle of like the fight going hey yo what and they're like (laughs) like sworn by necrons and the necrons just literally stop what they're doing and then just walk away and they get invited to meet the silent king and dante goes i've heard a rumor of a silent king and i didn't even think it was real 
but we might as well go see for ourselves because we're you know if it is a silent game we could possibly you know the opportunity is just there they can't say no and bearing in mind in this trip dante and the blood angels with him and the rhino i believe they're in is filled with explosives and the triggers that they're holding in their own gauntlets like pressure gauntlet like it's one of those triggers where if they let go it'll all go because they're thinking we might as well take the opportunity to basically suicide ourselves with the silent king and then when uh dante appears before the silent king he looks at the silent king he was like kind of sitting down like crouched kind of like not standing up like a regal ruler but more like a sort of nomadic figure he turns around and he's wearing a mask of sanguinius on his face but it's one where it's smiling unlike dante's death mask which is sanguinius looking sad and the blood angels just go like like imagine like this is like for them they're seeing a xenos wear their father's face yeah. that's very much like someone going you know basically literally like a demon wearing jesus's like face well you'd be like mm. <gasps> so they're like oh you... this little thing i just put on like boy take that off it's my best <laughs> outfit so what can i say yeah so he was they were like this is they were, they were so far beyond disgusted like they weren't angry anymore you know like you go far beyond anger where it's mm. like i'm not even pissed i'm like i don't even know what i should be feeling but um it's quite interesting because like silent king's arrow goes up to him and basically whispers in his ear he's like hey how mama the bee was been <laughs> he's like sort of a little bit you know sussy and he's because again he doesn't speak out loud properly he sort of whispers his intentions to dante and they basically say yo tyranny are coming bro want to team up it was a mistake we shouldn't have been fighting and then dante goes fine it's a good idea because it's an imperial world but technically but actually slowly the necrons start evacuating their forces and they they let basically the blood angels take a lot of the brunt but they still manage to beat, beat off the uh beat the tyrannids off not beat off the tyrannids <laughs> beat yeah. the tyrannids. okay all right. <laughs> sorry i'm a bit of a flub um but that's kind of his most recent appearance and even i guess as i said like prior nexus he's still trying to unite the, the dynasties but not really as their all-powerful ruler but more as a sort of um rally crying figure to help fight a great threat and the Immotech is clearly proving to be a problem and that's kind yeah. of the end of it's a bit of a shame because Zara doesn't have hmm. again he's a bit more of a mysterious figure kind of like how even the emperor has very more clandestine like dialogue than this guy does um <laughs> and the, the emperor is meant to be like a distant you know figure um, but that's kind of it on um, Zarek, though. I do believe, if there's anything else, I think that might be the last. Unless, Andy, you've got like, a few minor ones you want to talk about? Um, I think there's only like a couple worth mentioning. There's, ba there's basically this entire dynasty called the Subakar, which is in the Jericho Reach, which is where the Death Watch books are. There was this uh, pharaoh known as Armon Tech, and he killed a Katan, and he was known as the Red Scythe, and he actually like killed it, and it was like, wow, that guy's cool. Um Everyone went to the, have their big nap nap. Everyone woke up, and for some reason, the pharaoh didn't wake up. And the uh, the cryptips had a look in his brain. They're like, "Oh, there's some weird stuff going on in there." Uh, but he's super powerful. We're not going to like just end him, but we can't wake him up because his brain's a bit damaged. And so there's like a big power struggle going on within them. There's like Ahotek, not to be confused with Armon Tech. Am I right? But like Ahotek is <laughs> God like, forbid the region below <laughs> and there's like a power struggle going on and they're kind of cool but they don't have much law i did a few videos on them but they're literally like there's like a destroyer lord who's pretty cool who's just like you know the guys with the hover pads for legs uh he's like one of the relatives of the red scythe and he went mental and for like millennia he woke up really like ahotek plotted for him to wake up millennia earlier than they were supposed to so he went insane and he kind of mm -hmm. plotted to be like, I'm going to make you wake up really early. I'm going to send you over here and you did it just so he could assume control. Um, mm -hmm. There's not really much more to say about them, but they're just kind of cool that like, oh, there's like a Necron who actually killed a Katan. Is mm -hmm. he a model? No. <laughs> Bearing in mind, the last guy that <laughs> no. did that, the last guy that did that created the destroyer or the yeah. um, flare <laughs> virus. Mm -hmm. So that kind of didn't go so hot um yeah bad track record it's like oh you killed a katan but you're gonna inherit some bad stuff just a minor oopsie <laughs> you can work past it yeah like, give or I mean, take away chromosomes how many necrons <laughs> really have the flare? like out of the hole right not many but it, they the, a lot of them say that it's the fate that'll take them all eventually i well, yeah but 
when you live forever, eventually something is going to go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> really, I think murdering a Catan, oh, some of you go a little bit goofy. <laughs> this is a small price to pay. Slight yeah. goof. Don't remember your entire yeah. identity. <laughs> when and the flayed ones themselves don't, like... Mother... I don't know. They, they, don't, they don't think they're goofy. <laughs> Servitors exist, and that is for yeah. a much less good purpose than murdering <laughs> an in whole ass katan. I don't want to. Oh, yeah. then you lose your memory. What the fuck? That dude got lobotomized. <laughs> Some servitors do remember as well. That's the horrific part. That's even or, or worse. There, or there are rumors that the Crimson Scythe actually wakes up sometimes and just does like a. He just like butchers like civilizations in the Jericho Reach and goes back to sleep and it's like, what? Huh, that's weird. <laughs> it's like you're not you and you're hungry. <laughs> you're butchering <laughs> civilizations. Jeez. What was that? I think that's <laughs> Snickers out there. Yeah. It's got Snickers over there as well, isn't it? Still. Snickers, yeah, we got Snickers. Oh thank God. Some things are like in um like the like um, North America are just not named the same. I'm kind of get was it um is it Lay's chips? Yeah. We got those. They're not called them. Lay's here. What are they? They're called walkers. Walkers? I mean, that's. I yeah, I'm not cool. messing with you. They're actually called no, walkers. I mean, I guess that's a little strange, but like, I, whatever. Oh, Axe body spray is not called Axe here. What is it called? Lynx. <laughs> like the animal. Oh, that's even oh, yeah. trashier. Here. Oh, Lynx? Oh, God. Yeah, because yeah. you know, like, are... when I was younger, people would make reference in like TVs, like, oh, you smell like Axe body spray. I'm thinking, like, what is Axe body spray? And I saw the thing, I'm like, yeah. oh, that's just Lynx. And it's like, oh, because it's probably something else called Axe. Axe or, Ax or like the one Lynx or uses. whatever you call it is already, I, they can call it whatever they want. The I, the only thing I can <laughs> yeah. ever associate it with is a high school locker room or some asshole. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. The, the main point is the Virgin Snickers versus the Chad Lion Bar. Let's just put Whoa, that out there. That sounds pretty tasty. Lion bars superior. I have to see a few more of those things, but yeah, like the the links and the walkers thing is still pretty in my mm -hmm. living rent free in my brain. <laughs> um, but speaking of not taking any or well, other things that live rent free in my brain, though, I think Colin was going to talk about something. Well, we had Necrons, but we had Necrons at home, I think, because we're going to talk about the OG Necrons, aren't we, Colin? <laughs> the original. The, 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 the copy my homework from this is the original homework <laughs> where they once came from the tomb kings tomb kings I, uh, i'll keep it uh relatively brief uh, especially because as with a lot of warhammer fantasy factions it's pretty easy to tell at least what the basis of them is the basis of the tomb kings is of course uh you know ancient egypt very cool uh oh would you like me to just a quick uh, clarification should i save uh all the comparisons between them for after the basics of the war yeah let's do it let's do it for the end yeah uh, I, this is just yeah. this introduced because obviously some people who are listening maybe are not as familiar with one yeah fantasy stuff so thought that was the plan just to, wanted mm. to clarify <laughs> uh the tube kings were once you know warhammerified egypt uh they were all alive you know they were they were people they were civilization of humans uh, the earliest one, in fact, in Warhammer Fantasy, uh, before you know the Empire, uh, Britonia, Kislev, any of the others, there was the Tomb Kings. Uh, they were, you know, Bronze Age-ish, but towards the end of their uh, time as humans. Spoiler alert, upcoming for that one. Uh, they started. A, they had limited access, very limited access to guns from Cathay. I think they even had like some like balloons and stuff, like steamship kind of things. Uh, so, you know, they had some cool stuff, but overall, Bronze Age humans, uh, they were initially very in touch with their gods, then they weren't, then they were, kind of you know, on and off thing. Uh, and they ruled over, because if you look at the Warhammer fantasy world, it's pretty clearly just like Earth, you know, the... the squashed some, a bit. Yeah, it's squashed a bit, then stretched back out. It was uh, it was Earth you dropped on the floor and then you had to quickly <laughs> put it back together again. Yeah. Yeah. We Especially... got a donation sorry from Zombie Eggplant for ten dollars. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, brother. Zombie, zombie Eggplant. eggplant. Thank it's you. a good name, it's a good uh, name. But uh Yeah, so they uh they were you know they were chugging along, uh survived the incursions of chaos, the great catastrophe when chaos first entered the world by fighting alongside their gods to drive out all those nasty demons. Uh, and, you know, then their civilization went on for quite a few thousand years. Uh, they were, they had obviously their golden ages, their not so golden ages. Uh, there were rulers, of course, like the one and only Cetra the Imperishable, 
who decided that the entire planet belonged to him, and he made a pretty damn good showing at doing that. Um, they, as time went on, started to realize... Uh, <laughs> and he's in another drawing here, but it's like a Tomb King with a chef hat. We're gonna. I'm gonna <laughs> assume that's business. a tomb guard. For Setcher would behead you for such insolence. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so eventually, Setcher himself and others kind of realized death is going to rob me of all my achievements. So they started working on becoming immortal, and they expanded their lives uh, by many years, and even some very limited immortality for some of those uh the mortuary cult who was looking for uh, immortality it was immortality but you still aged so eventually they turned into these desiccated mummies it was immortality light die immortality yeah they, they weren't gonna die immortality zero <laughs> they might they might wish they were dead immortality uh, new flavorings yeah new coke immortality <laughs> but uh yeah and so but again, as with all things, you know, rises and falls, ups and downs with their civilization. They were overall pretty prosperous, though. It from the outside, it didn't look like much was gonna, you know, really bring them down. Because, you know, obviously, you know, there's orcs everywhere. It's a Warhammer setting. They're gonna find orcs. There would be, you know, orc hordes they fight, occasional demons, chaos worshippers, stuff like that that they fight and deal with pretty handily. We have and then another what... um, dono from Tom Warren here. Thank you, Tom. He puts, um, the Warhammer you. world is just what we Weird. have. <laughs> Earth at home, me. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Tomb the... Kings are... Yeah. Oh, you, you no, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tomb Kings are doing pretty good. And then, one certain individual named Nagash was born. And then very rapidly, the Tomb Kings Such stopped the power... doing very good. Such uh -oh. is the power of Nagash. <laughs> that line is... So good. The, uh, the most narcissistic person who's ever existed, by the way. And yeah. he does, he's not really a Tomb King, but we he's just honorary mention. He's pretty involved oh, in their story. Yeah, you can't yeah, talk about enough, the Tomb Kings enough. and not mention him, because then you're just skipping what happened that made them the Tomb Kings. Mm. Uh, he was born the first son of a Tomb King king. At this point, they were just Nehekarans. Problem is, Tomb King society is a little bit goofy. The firstborn son goes to the mortuary cult instead of being the king. Nagash did not like this, but because he went to the mortuary cult, he learned how to be a wizard. So he started studying dark magic, started getting a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit evil. Uh, he was kind of always evil. This is post death of great conqueror Setra the Imperishable. Yes, well, Setra. Setra's like the Alexander of. Um... The Tomb King, like Alexander the Great, the Tomb Kings, and this is basically, I think it's a hundred couple. And it's not explained how long after. It's it a comes. long while afterwards. It's quite a while after, but date, Cetra but... is like a great, like Cetra's got a pyramid and shit, and um, yeah. basically this this is way, you know, centuries down the line. Also, we yeah. have another dono here by um Lelouch Rue. Thank, Thank you, brother. Again, we appreciate your support as always. He says, sorry I'm late, here now, what I miss, love your work, keep it up. Uh, we're just hitting uh, Tomb Kings right now, but we're just, did, Eli did a great lashing of Necron Lords. Obviously, we're going to compare the two more to the end, but Colin's just directing us through the the bone, or well, the not yet bone daddies. The soon to be. <laughs> He's talking about All the right, most selfish I'm not, person. I'm, I'm not a fan of that, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Colin's talking about the most selfish individual. I didn't do anything. The scum of the earth. In the Warhammer world, Nagash. So, uh, yeah, Nagash starts learning how to do magic. And then eventually, uh, a neighboring city-state to his brings over some dark elves they captured to be used as sacrifices. And Nagash goes, I'm going to learn magic from them. So he does. He, he, was, he was supposed to sacrifice them. He didn't. He just locked them in the basement of a pyramid. And uh, he gave them a deal. You can either teach me dark magic or I can kill you here and now. And uh, that's quite the hard bargain. So they agreed. And Nagash became the first human ever to properly wield dark magic. Uh, mm. They escaped, and then he killed them, which is pretty impressive, because, you know, Elves' whole thing is they're good at the magics, and Nagash was like, yeah, but no, I'm, I'm better. Uh, so he killed them, and then Nagash killed his brother, who was the king, uh, cucked him, and took his wife, <laughs> uh, you know, just really add to the list of reasons he's a piece of shit mm -hmm. uh started raising the dead which in the hecarin society is a big no-no because well first of all he was the first necromancer he invented it 
Second of all, death is sacred. You're not supposed to do with dick with them. And he said, yeah, but free army forever. So he raised uh, the dead to rule his stolen city. He started bankrupting Kemri, the capital of uh, Nehekara. And uh, eventually he was defeated by the seven nation army of seven other city states, was driven out and came back after, you know, a, a pretty decent amount of time. And in the meantime, he had accidentally invented vampires because someone stole his research notes and didn't quite get the formula right for eternal life. And with them as his new lieutenants, and of course his ever-loyal servant, Arkin the Black, he waged war on the Hecara. And this time, he was going big or going home. I think so he accidentally he, turned into a lich as well at this time. For yeah, some. he uh, he died, but he decided that was lame, so he just possessed he, his body He died again. but got better. It, it was exa- He died but got better. Pretty much. <laughs> uh, there were some things Nagash did, but this isn't quite all about Nagash, just the Tomb Kings, so I'm um, Speeding up a little bit past that. Uh, as he was invading the Hecara, he was killing everyone. He was poisoning the Great River Vite, which is you know the Not Nile. Uh, and he was getting ready to cast a spell to kill everyone on the planet and then raise all of their corpses. Uh, which he kind of got off. It only killed everyone in the Hecara and raised them up. But that pretty swiftly put an end to, you know, Nehekara. Uh, everyone died. Yeah. Except for failed the failed successfully. <laughs> yeah. Except for the last king of all kings of the tomb kings, Al Qadizar, who with the help of the Skaven of all people, managed to slay Nagash and send his spirit back to the afterlife for about five minutes, because he's a necromancer that doesn't really stick. But as it means for the tomb kings, Nagash is gone, and they have to contend with the fact that they're now all undead. Which is caused some problems because it wasn't just uh, the last line of, you know, the existing Nehekarans that was brought back. It was pretty much all of them. Uh, everyone who ever died and still had a reasonably intact skeleton or and or mummy. So you'd like to see your granddad, your great granddad and his yeah, great granddad. All of like them. Spider-Man memes that like everyone like pointing at each other. It's kind of going, <laughs> but you. Just like people going, hey, granddad, put some clothes on. I can see your bones. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't great. And all of the newly resurrected Tomb Kings started fighting amongst each other until uh, the Hierophant Katap woke up Cetra and said, please fix this because we clearly can't do this on our own, which he then did because he's Cetra the Imperishable and pretty swiftly knocked everyone back into line. And that kind of brings us to the modern-day Tomb Kings. They've been like this for quite a few thousand years, uh, to the point that even by the time of Sigmar being born, they had already been Tomb Kings for quite a few years. Uh, So, and then uh, ever since, they've been, honestly, even more fractured than the Necrons. Some of them just want to sit in Nehekara. Some of them want to conquer outwards. Some of them don't really care and are just trying to have fun with immortality. Some of them frantically want to get a new body back, uh, be it like just any body they can put their soul into. Uh, the mortuary cult did promise Cetra he would return with a new golden body. So some of them are like, ooh, that'd be that'd be something cool I'd like to get. <laughs> it's it's messy in the Hikara, but with Cetra kind of vassalizing everyone, he basically told them, look, you can fight amongst yourselves a little bit. But when I call you, it's time to fight. So there is some semblance of order in Nehekara, kind of like with the Silent King. But it's very tenuous, and the moment Cetra isn't looking, it uh, kind of falls apart. Goes to crap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The way you said it's always messy, just made me think of a, a tie-in of it's always sunny in Nekahara. <laughs> <laughs> N- Nagash turns, <laughs> I'm just going to go and conquer, you know, Altdorf. <laughs> Nagash fails to be of course. Cetra likes to have his tools. He likes to bind. He likes to bind. I like to bind. I like to have my tools. God, that's a good episode. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows a reference there. Oh, man. It's always sunny in the Hikari. That's so good, damn it. I think, I'm so annoyed I didn't think of that. Uh, uh, yeah, that's yeah. that's like the that's the basics of the, you know, the Tomb Kings. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. Would it and, be uh, fair to say there's like between Nagash and Setra, there's parallels with, for example, uh, Sarek and Emotech? 
because I know the kind of thing is that the Tomb Kings are the origins of like the inspiration for the Necrons. Is there much overlap in that regard? There's some, like you can definitely see some parallels, but like with Nagash and Imhotek specifically, like do correct me if I'm wrong, but Imhotek doesn't have this complete and utter disdain for his fellow Necrons. Like obviously he doesn't like the Silent King, but he doesn't see it like, you know, another mm. Necron and is like, you're dirt. Like, is that yeah. roughly in the ballpark? I think Nag- so. Nagash does not care anything about like he's he didn't take power because he wanted to restore order because his dynasty was a shit show. He took power because he's evil and uh, his his motivations kind of end and stop at I'm evil. Yeah. Sadly, Nagash is not quite in Total War Warhammer yet, but with a mod. Quite... Oh, it's, it's not quite. I know official, it's not yeah. official, but that it is That's a pretty impressive mod, though. It's one of those mods that makes you go, Why aren't you just working for the, the company? <laughs> Why are you doing this for free? But uh, speaking of lords, though, I do believe quite a few of these uh, Tomb King lords actually you're able to sort of play in the uh, Total War Warhammer franchise at the moment, though. Indeed. Oh. Uh, there are. Do you want to, sorry, you can keep going. Sorry, you go through it. <laughs> yeah, I say I'll go. I'll go through. Like it'll mostly be the legendary lords from Total Warhammer, but a couple different ones. Uh, we'll start with uh, you know Ark in the Black, uh, alphabetical, and he's Nagash's right hand man. So fair to start with him. Right hand. I will of course bitch. save the. <laughs> Just yeah, jump, yeah. Bitch. I will of course save the best for last. So there's a reason I'm not starting with him. Don't worry. Uh, Ark in the Black. He was once just kind of a hedonistic scumbag of a nobleman. And uh, just kind of floating through life being a hedonistic scumbag. Uh, <laughs> there's, I think, w- there's a couple different explanations that have been used for his teeth being black. You know, call him Ark, we'll call him Ark in the Black. One is that his teeth were all rotted and disgusting, and he chewed a root that made them, like, blackened. He, he was an unpleasant person to be around when he was alive. Yeah. He became Nagash's servant, and... And in a bit of a competent, like, everything boost, like, he went from this scumbag nobody to someone who would probably be, honestly, a pretty clever, like, anti-hero at worst, were it not for the fact that his boss is Nagash, who's really just here to eat your soul and enslave you forever, so if he had a better boss, he might be a lot cooler of a dude. He just needed but, someone to believe in him. That's yeah, what he needed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, someone who isn't Nagash. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, Arkin, he's... Very clever. He's a very gifted uh, mage, and he died early. Uh, he escaped Nagash's first death. He didn't die, but when Nagash was put down the second time, uh, no, pardon me, I, I got that flipped. He, uh, I believe, he died holding off uh, the armies that would allow Nagash to escape the first time around. He was brought back because Nagash kind of invented necromancy, so that's really not much of a chore for him. And ever since Arkin has been his right hand man. As for his role in the Tomb Kings, he's a bit, he's definitely the black sheep of them all. Uh, Cetra very begrudgingly allows him to exist, uh, although he regularly goes to war with him whenever Arkin gets a bit too obvious that he's trying to bring back Nagash. And (laughs) Arkin, for his part, is kind of a mercenary. Like, he'll go around the world looking for, like, things that can help his necromantic powers to bring back Nagash. And in the process, you know, sometimes he he works for people you might not expect, you know, like whoever. If the end result will be he's able to get neck like artifacts of necromantic power or even can just afford to buy them from somewhere, he he's taken some mercenary contracts for other tomb kings, occasionally for you know other factions. He gets around. And of course, he's the only tomb king, aside from Nagash, that has returned in the age of Sigmar. So hey, if uh that interests you, Arkin's still around and kicking. Kind of Eltharian threw him into the into the void. So who knows what's going on? <laughs> he's with that. a bit he's a bit lost. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he also he of course had a starring role in the end times. Uh, he killed Warhammer's first ever special character, like ever. Wow. Uh, Heinrich Kemmler. Oh, uh, feels bad. He's a uh, Arkans of Lich. Yeah, necromantic yeah. wizard who uh, yeah. is, he fights Gotrick and Felix a couple or well, one time I believe. Yeah, I Heinrich Kemmler does. Although he promptly leaves before. Nature can take its course on that front. <laughs> Before it gets an axe between the legs or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and during the end times, he's uh, obviously he's doing all of the gashes moves that he needs someone important to do. 
Uh, he, it, it's even funny when he kills Kemmler because you know he's noticed the Lich Master and Arkin's a Lich, and he even I think like makes a snide comment to himself like, eh, "The Lich is beating the Lich Master. I'm so fucking clever." <laughs> uh, he turned into a bit of a sarcastic smart mouth in the end times for some reason, which is neat. Uh, but yeah, that's Arkin. Right hand of Nagash is the most important thing to know about him. Quite powerful though, not the kind of guy you want to mess with. Uh, next. Uh, I, I can't keep calling. I call, DJ Katap is what people like. People have called him because he has this like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he rides like the mount. It <laughs> looks kind of like a DJ table. Mm. Uh, he was the one of the heads of the Mortuary Cult, and which means he's a lich of quite good magical power. And his importance in the Tomb Kings comes when he is. You know, decided to wake Setcher up because the infighting was a bit absurd by that point. He's like, I need someone who will fix this. Now, the problem there lies in the fact that the Mortuary Cult had made a promise that they weren't going to wake Setcher back up until they had found a way to give him his golden body. So he woke Setcher back up, he brought everyone into line, and then he immediately exiled Katep for not having that golden body for him <laughs> and said he can never return until you give me that body. So Katap kind of just wanders the Warhammer world looking for anything that can help give the Tomb Kings a proper body once again. Uh, that's you know, really the extent of what he does. Uh, he is the one who returned in the end times to warn Setra that Nagash was coming back for real this time. Whereupon Setra heard him out, thanked him, and then cut his head off. <laughs> Because uh, he had he still not... He, he, hey, he didn't find the golden oh. body. Setra's not one, to, not one to be trifled with. I guess so. Uh, Damn, hell of a way to go though. <laughs> Just in, like, not, it, yeah. not really worth it, but worth it. There's oh, a God. Kalida, uh, warrior queen, uh, high queen Kalida. She's very cool. She's uh, worshipped the serpent god, because you'll notice there's a lot of parallels between Egyptian mythology and the Tomb Kings. And her cousin was the first vampire, Neferata. And Neferata, uh, I don't know, Kalida found out Neferata was a vampire and kind of made that known uh, to the Tomb Kings at large before they were the Tomb Kings. And Neferata accidentally killed her in a duel and tried to bring her back, uh, except the sa snake goddess Asaph poisoned Kalida's blood so she would not become a vampire uh, and killed her on the spot, which is a weird way to save someone, but it's better than, I guess, <laughs> eternal damnation from vampirism. Uh, it's, and when she came back as a tomb queen, she was, uh, very honored. She's one, she was pretty much the only one Setcher didn't have to beat in the line because Setcher came back and she was just like, yeah, or whatever. Just let me kill vampires and I'll be content to do whatever you tell me to do. Uh, she's one of those kind of like you were saying earlier, Eli, with like Zandrak being one of the few that has a personality. She and her army is like one of the few that have a, like a, particularly standout personality like her uh her constructs are some of the only ones that have like a personality like some of her tomb guard or the what are they called ushabti i like kind of play like pranks and stuff uh <laughs> like they're, they like to just make jokes and they're kind of they're fun to be around or as fun as any tomb king to be around and even uh her she meets Godric and felix once and gives them an ultimatum by putting a wrist like just a bracelet on Felix's wrist and says, Hey, you go kill these, you go kill this vampire that's causing me such problems. And if you make it back to me in time, I will, you know, put the thing, take the thing off your wrist. Man, that is a big hat. <laughs> we forgot to mention Ark okay. in the Black has basically like a massive black I, yeah. Pope hat. Yeah. So it kind of looks like if. The Lord forbid his holiness went to war, but then he also <laughs> was a skeleton. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, with and the guy. <laughs> yeah, and a goth. With the Gotrick and Felix, they killed the vampire in time, but they didn't quite make it back to Lamia, the king, the, the city-state she rules in time. And the wrist thing, you know, it happened, but it didn't poison Felix. Uh, and so they were confused, like, what? Did did you release me? And Neferato's like, no, I was just fucking with you the whole time. And he poisoned that thing <laughs> and it dried up centuries ago. <laughs> so she's a, a bit of a goofball when she wants to be, but she's also incredibly dedicated to hunting vampires because in her eyes her eyes they're part of the reason they all turned into tomb kings and even beyond that they're just unholy and the first one was her cousin so she's got a lot of personal beef 
with vampires specifically. Hmm. Uh, there is a couple more minor ones. Uh, <laughs> Someone said The Mummy Returns. Which, like, can we just point out how good that film was, the first one? I haven't least. seen it. <laughs> You don't see the I, Mummy I, Returns? I've never, I've never no. seen any of the Mummy movies. Is, is, is oh, of course. Colin's like never a seen a goofy damn movie? film. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Is it a goofy Brandon Fraser movie? It's not a goofy Brandon Fraser It's not really goofy, funny. it's good. It's it's classic. It's goofy in a good way, though. Like, it's not... Right. I guess it's, it's not trying to be goofy. It was very serious at the time, but it it's just like aged. All, all the fun moments of, like, uh, the goofy moments of Indiana Jones, but that's the entire film. And it aged like it wine, fun. though. Those films are pretty good. <laughs> right, Honestly, it's right. a childhood vibe. In this year, and maybe a bit before your time, to be fair, but... <laughs> just don't watch The Scorpion King, because the CGI rock is terrifying. Oh, my God. That's, <laughs> it's still this, it's the worst CGI in all film history. It, like, oh, he, it's it's fun, really fun bad. <laughs> God, I remember the fair, watching The Mummy, the first one. You got, if you guys watch it now as adults, we'd be like, oh, it's not that bad. But the actual mummy scared the crap out of me when I was like <laughs> a kid because it looked so horrific. Um, but speaking of the actual only, proper mummies, though. <laughs> the only scene I've seen is when one of them is like approaching the one guy and he's just pulling out every single religious object. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then he pulls out a star David and he's like, ah, you speak the language of the slaves. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, by the way, uh, Colin, we've got a donation from Looty McShooty for $5. Saying, question for Mr. No Work. Which VTuber <laughs> would be a good Tomb Lord? My guess would be Pippa, because cringe. Uh, Lumi's the one who likes fantasy, so her. And I will move on from this for the benefit of the three <laughs> other people who are probably <laughs> sitting here like, shut oh, up. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you, and there's my answer. Oh, Chad, we're uh, sorry we haven't seen The Mummy. Please have mercy. I'm not. Lorcoy's <laughs> movie night is a pretty good idea, Chad. We probably would get mm. copyright strike. Immediately. Might do that for like a private... Um, Members Discord like only thing or yeah, Discord yeah. thing maybe one time. Uh there's two more I want to mention real quick. There's Apophis, who was a a real scumbag. Uh he was a prince who wanted to be a, the king of the city state of Numis, but you know, he wasn't he wasn't gonna get, get the throne. So what he did was uh slit the throats of everyone who was going to have the throne, and then just kind of declared himself king. That'll which went it. I, yeah, that went as well as you'd expect. Like everyone just ganged up on him and beat him up, and then as execution, they threw him in a pit of no, pardon me, it wasn't a pit. He was put in a sarcophagus filled with flesh-eating scarabs, and they closed it on him. Yeah. Uh, and nice. when they op they opened it back up, the scarabs had all disappeared, and there was just a human skull, which they then inscribed a curse on just for good measure, and threw it in the desert. And so in this the, is the plot of the mummy, then, because that did happen to some, that something similar really? happens to one guy. <laughs> with probably what the inspiration was. Oh, really? uh, there's a, a I, it's not really a spoiler, but like a plot, well, a part of the movie, like eh. a flesh eating scarab goes, it buries into a guy, and you oh, see. Oh, yeah, it. and it's got, you can see it going up his you wrist. Can, like, yeah, Aah. you can see it moving under his skin, and it's yeah. like, oh. Interesting. Well, apparently, the bracelet story is from the mummy as well. Oh. Yeah, oh, there is, <laughs> that's the mummy, too. And there's like a bracelet thing they put someone, on. Someone get someone get the release dates. I mean, the mummy was after Warhammer Fantasy. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. I sure hope. BRB and you mean. <laughs> All right, cut on out, brave soldier. But uh, yeah, it was it? So then Apophis he gets to the underworld and would be you know denied entrance into the honored halls of you know heaven. The best case scenario he had was eternal torment. The worst case scenario was just get his soul erased. Like you're gone. Goodbye. And he made a deal because he was still technically royalty and royalty were allowed to make deals with the gods for some yeah. reason uh, with the god of the dead, Usirian. And he said, listen, if I can find a soul that's an exact match for mine, uh, can I go to heaven? And Usirian was like, yeah, sure, that sounds good to me. Go look for that soul. So Apophis is this wandering assassin with a body made out of scarabs that just yeah. wanders around looking for an equal soul. But he's never going to find it because no two souls are made exactly equal. Uh, like, So uh, he's basically just doomed himself to forever wander the lands as a murder hobo. <laughs> and, uh, nice. It's not ideal. And then, of course, the last greatest tomb king, Cetra the Imperishable, and his fullest of titles that no joke takes two hours straight to say. 
<laughs> someone uh, in the comment section is gonna be br what some brave soldier is gonna put the entire thing in the comments. Yeah, section. if someone wants to go find that the total war copy pasta and just throw that in, that'd be <laughs> that'd be great. We'll pin it. We'll pin it. Uh, but un there. but unlike you know, I would say quite a good deal amount of characters with many titles. This man earned all of them. As a tomb king, he was the greatest. He, uh, you know that you know it's better to be feared than loved, but have both. Setcher was smart. He uh, he got both. He made sure to treat his people fairly, uh, even the slaves. He built monuments to the gods, brought back their uh, favor to Nehekara. Uh, he did that by sacrificing all of his children in their honor. And if you rebelled against Setra, you were no longer on the map of Nehekara. If I do, I remember correctly that I think isn't Nagash a descendant of Setra? I think in some like distant, distant. I like think it's Al Qadizar because I think I've read that like there was a like a either a son Setra had after he did you know the first round of you know filicide, or uh, at one he missed. Or is that and... or is Vlad or who would become Vlad? He was a descendant of Nagash because that was why he got given um, sort of special treatment over Neferata. Was that Nagash like? Oh, you're a descendant of mine. I'll oh, find you'll be you'll become the. Uh, leader of the vampires or something at the time. I don't remember that, but I'm not not well, gonna well, say it, it didn't it, happen. Well, it's hard because like Vlad, that stuff is either like it's it's in flux. It's not quite because some things say like he was like he was chosen as like um sort of he was turned into a vampire by Neferata and then made like her consort, and then the other ones it was just Nagash basically chose him as like a leader because he sort of def like um excuse me he like defected to their side and he was basically like ah but you're like my descendant that's kind of cool and so he is, is contradictory in some uh circles but I, I do think nagash was a descendant of setra in Al some capacity al Qadizar was like i think I'm not quite solidly confirmed but close to it like he had some of setra's blood in him i don't remember ever hearing about that from nagash or just like, is this like the Charlemagne thing where it's like everyone's the descendant of Charlemagne? I, it could also be that, that where it's ago, like, yeah. yeah, it's so long ago. And plus, it's like it, it gives you, you know, some amount of prestige to just go, yeah, I, I come from big cool guy. <laughs> oh, is it? There's a, oh, go ahead, Alex. Oh, go ahead. Whenever anyone mentions Charlemagne, I just think of Christopher Lee because he's yeah. a metal album called Charlemagne. He's just like, I kill the blood of Saxon men. I shed the blood, the blood of many of 4, Saxon men. Thousand Saxon men. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's so like when um when people were saying like um oh I'm you know in my ancestry I'm a descendant of William the Conqueror it's like yeah most of Europe is to be fair as well yeah so it's not that special. we're all kind of I think what's the even weirder one where I found um this is way off topic but someone did it in uh, there's like a channel that did um he just showed like descendant histories and things like you know like, like charts and there's maps and the queen is a descendant of Muhammad. Hmm. Which is like you basically go like oh like so literally everyone's connected to everyone at some point. Well, yeah, isn't so, it? It's like you're only five steps removed from pretty much anyone on planet Earth if you try and yeah. find that. But hmm. Setcher was not five steps away from everyone because he was in people's faces as soon yeah. as he. Yeah, he was. Uh, he, he, he's a conqueror, man. <laughs> he was about. <laughs> yeah, and as a tomb king, he expanded Camry to its greatest borders. I mean, the dude ended up in Lustre at one point, which, for reference, imagine ancient Egyptians, you know, going to South America. He, he conquered a round. Well, uh, just a quick thing. They're not called Tomb Kings at this point, are they? No, I, I'm calling them Tomb Kings just because... The, the kingdom the of Nehekara. At this point, yeah, the they're land. just like Nehekarans. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he, of course, founded the Mortuary Cult because when uh, he was starting to get a little bit older, he started realizing, I can't punch death in the face. I can't, I can't fight that enemy and win. So he needed people to solve that for him. Uh, still went on to do great things, conquer, and he was both feared and loved by his people. Because again, he treated them fairly, but if they stepped even an inch out of line, they were beheaded pretty much instantly. Hmm. And when he finally died, he was angry at it, but he started the, uh, he bid the mortuary cult to find that damn golden body for him and started the trend of Nehekaran kings building big old pyramids and taking their entire army with them to be buried alongside them, which means God, Nehekara must have had a lot of people in it, because that is there's a lot of people going in with them every time. Jesus. Uh, and, yeah, no one would build a pyramid bigger than Cetras, because they were that 
afraid and respectful of the guy. And when Nagash did his, you know, he did the funny and brought all the Tomb Kings back, his was the only pyramid that didn't uh, automatically awaken, for his was given such powerful protective wards that even Nagash couldn't penetrate it. When he rode back out, he just started bitch slapping Tomb Kings and Queens left and right until they started behaving. And he declared that Nehekar would rebuild and the Age of Conquest would begin once again. Because even though he didn't have a golden body, he's back in Immortal now uh, in some capacity. So it's time for him to get to work. Uh, some quick fun facts about him. He burned down half of Norska because one of them stole his crown once and that just, that wasn't going to go unpunished. <laughs> And it's quite uh, cold, so burning it down is quite a feat. <laughs> honestly, yeah, it was pretty impressive. It's also, you know, going from Egypt to Scandinavia, so yeah. pretty it's impressive. Quite... The fact that they have boats is still surprising yeah. to me. Yeah. But I suppose in a way, it's like, you don't need winter clothing. You ain't got any skin. Yeah, fair <laughs> it's enough. Not like you're going to freeze. If anything, the ice encasing your bones might be like extra armor. Hmm. Uh, but he, uh, at one point, the High Elves decided... Uh, to help him out with a demon incursion on his front line, and he was so generous that he allowed them to leave with their lives intact. <laughs> so, so compassionate at times. Uh, such, such a good man. Or every now and then, yeah. <laughs> he, he, truly a great man. <laughs> truly, truly so so forgiving. <laughs> uh, every now and then, he likes to try and blow up Nagash's Black Pyramid, both because it's an evil, magical waypoint, and because Nagash built it bigger than his, and that simply cannot be allowed. Uh, it doesn't work, but, you know, A for a for effort. Because it's, it's made a black... We should preface... Nagash made this during his mortal lifetime, which was a massive blasphemy, and it's made of uh, a special black stone that just is nigh on... Dis but Nage the, the black stone slash pyramid and again is something we have to keep revisiting because the amount of it's, science yeah, it's is like... blown up by Skaven. By Skaven. So funny. That's later, though. That's not quite Tomb King's lore. That's the gash. Yeah, I think no. we... Another yeah. time. Uh, and he is perhaps the only person in the end times to get a death that doesn't make you angry. Uh, because Nagash, uh, he fought Nagash, who had by this point ascended to godhood, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and was doing a pretty good job of it. Eventually Nagash got the upper hand, uh, told Setra to serve him. Setra screams, Setra does not serve, Setra rules, which is the hardest goes so line. hard. And then Nagash blew up all but his skull so he could watch Kemri burn. And then Setra was given something that I don't think any other character was given in Warham any Warhammer setting. A no-strings-attached offer by the Chaos Gods, who said they would not only give him back his body, but restore him, you know, give him that golden body he wanted so badly. They would give him Nehekar to rule over once again. They would give him everything he ever wanted if they would just serve him. Setra does not serve. Setra rules. So Setra mm -hmm. walked all the way from Egypt to Germany, uh, pretended to help Archeon, killed a being the size of a mountain, a dragon ogre, and then right as he saw Nagash again, he cut off a bloodthirster's head in one swing that was about to get the drop on Nagash, told him he will forgive them until he can kill all four of the Chaos Gods himself, and then charged into an infinite tide of demons, uh, like doom guy <laughs> nice. he's he's still perhaps one of the absolute coolest characters in all of warhammer and, just uh, slap so hard and while you know lore. obviously the planet blew up and we have age of sigor now it should be noted such as never once described as dying <laughs> so if nice. you'd like as i do you can believe that such is still out there like gotrick was in the warp cutting his way straight to the chaos gods they just haven't spat him out yet. To be fair, I, they, they wish they could, but you cannot get you can't get rid of Cetra that easily. <laughs> He's literally imperishable. He he just cannot be put down. Nope. The uh, <laughs> the Norskin who stole his crown killed him once. Except Tomb Kings are immortal. They respawn, which is why he then went right back to Norska and burned down half of it to get his crown back. Hmm. That would be pretty scary, like because you're in the middle of the icy waste, and then it's like, is that an army for the skeletons? Like, yep. <laughs> what did he do in there? <laughs> <laughs> we only have one village of like full of huts. Yup. <laughs> we have catapults with skulls flying at us. Yup. <laughs> That's pretty uh horrific though. I think is that all of the uh Tomb King Lords I think we're gonna mention today, Colin? Uh pardon me, the uh 
is that all of the uh, Tomb King lords, I think, for today? That was, if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about, I of course can, but I figured that with a, you know, it would be a brief overview of the Tomb Kings and we can go talk about the similarities because obviously yeah. quite a few. Yeah, so um, for the next section, we're going to briefly talk about how, again, you can probably guess the similarities between these two factions is pretty, um, well, they're basically, this, they're, I'm pretty sure two, obviously, two kings were around, um, I think, I don't know what decade they were event, uh, written, but they've been around in quite early, like Warhammer history and Warhammer lore, and even on the table. I mean, fair, at the time was... Um, recording the tomb kings have returned and the old world has returned to tabletop <laughs> and the tomb kings got uh, a new model i believe as well which mm -hmm. i think kind of goes hard Lich king on dragon i think it's so yeah, cool goes pretty hard and obviously i think well the first thing i was going to mention is particularly that each of these factions had a moment where they kind of turned into undead because mm -hmm. again they both were living breathing beings and the well the similarity is obviously the fact that um, it's kind of against their will a lot of it, mm -hmm. I think. Like, obviously, like, the Necrons went through, basically, they walked into the emulation chambers, and they emerged outside as the Necrons, and then for the Tomb Kings themselves, I think, I don't know if you might have said it before, Con, there's an interesting like tidbit, which is that when the Necron like death wave magic from Nagash went off, Mm -hmm. So the one, the people who are still alive in Nehekara, obviously yeah. Nehekara looked like, like crap at that point. Yeah, it was it was once yeah. pretty verdant, but by that point it was becoming more yeah. and more desert. It was like gash. it got Chicagoed. Um, uh, indeed, <laughs> but, but but essentially the people there, like there's like a death wave, and then they would have come back to life immediately. So when all the Tomb Kings <laughs> slash came back to life, like their descendants, the still living ones, would have had all their flesh still. But yeah, but their like hearts were still and everything. There was no circulation, mm -hmm. so over time that it was like the desert winds stripped them of their bones. Yeah, so it's a pretty like interesting to their bones, not of yeah, their bones. <laughs> there's there's a nice like difference there in a sense. But I think the also the main thing is that in a way, I think the the soul the, the difference between these two different parts is that the undead of the Necrons, the Necrons are like fully gone, as in their souls and their stuff has been devoured and i so this might be like more of a personal opinion but the necrons compared to necron tier the necrons are just an imprint of all the information of who that person was in life that person is very much dead and gone so like trays in the necron tier is just like full-on dead it, mm -hmm. it always makes me way, wonder yeah. though because like blanks you know they're born without a soul or a negative soul it's weird like some like ways I read soul, it is sometimes yeah. like it makes me think like in Warhammer 40k at least the soul is like an organ almost that you can <laughs> take out it can mm. still keep going but obviously not as you once were but it's also like dark souls it's a currency uh, yeah <laughs> yeah remember there's a there's a, there's a weird bit of it do you know about this Andy in Dragon Age where like if the mage goes out of control they can t they do a process where they basically get rid of their soul almost. Yeah, uh, they make them tranquil, where they basically completely remove. So they they talk like this, and they're alive, but they basically have no personality because it's better to take away everything that makes them themselves than let them go loose and cause damage and become abominations where they transform. So they yeah, so there's a, there's a nice cool like link if anyone's into Dragon Age. There's a cool link there. I do love Dragon Age. But I think I, I do like that there's a slight difference in you know like the Tomb Kings, like their souls are definitely intact. Like yeah. they've been mm -hmm. at least for back. the kings themselves. I do think, but then again, the there's the sort of a sim the sim the big similarity sim ah, similarity I see as well is when um the level of like sentience, like a lot like in the lower half souls, I think they talk about how like basic soldiers, they still there's like some glim glitters of memory of yeah. Skill. It's like they still have laborers, for instance, but like they don't really. It's like like a half remembered dream. Like they'll just go about making pottery, not because it's for any purpose. It's just what they did in life, and it's the only thing they really have left of them. It's kind of like hmm. there's a so the big similarity there. Like the Necron warriors are kind of there's like echoes of their memories in there but again they're just kind of brain dead like servants a lot of the time as well as 
but then sort of like the ones who like live in like the noble caste, like even Cetra. Cetra still has part of his body. Like he still has like skin. Like it's obviously like decayed and uh, rotted on him, but the, to show like the level, like the preservation obviously of the noble class was way better. Just like how the Necrons, the like trades in and all the laws, they've basically retained most of their personalities if they're lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, like the Necrons, so the, the Tomb Kings, they pretty much have a sort of si- a similar shtick where like the actual tomb of kings and the lords they definitely still have like oh i remember who i was but then like brian over there you know I get, it, it does de- vary from different i think kingdoms doesn't it because like you said like the um kalida one kalida's kingdom yes yeah, so, some still... of them still have like they've got a little bit more life left in them i guess uh some of them are like a little bit you know a, have a little bit more personality but obviously you know the higher up you go on the totem pole of tomb kings like the kings and the princes are going to have most of their minds intact i mean they might have gone insane but they still have a mind and a soul to be insane with hmm. versus... depends on the quality of the lich <laughs> priest <laughs> he also also does that you know if you got the bargain brand you know <laughs> lich priest from wish who was doing your, uh, your entombment <laughs> imagine being a lord like why did i get the fucking walmart lich priest yeah. over here? <laughs> god i'm trying to buy myself you know a new pyramid next to the guns or something section yeah. or something in walmart uh Another similarity is that they're very prone to infighting. Um, like, no. you know, there's like the civil wars between the Necron dynasties and Cetra was only woken up because another Tomb Kings could get along. Uh, the difference there being that pound for pound, I think the Tomb Kings have it worse because like the Necrons were the ones who were like the already dead Necrons weren't brought to biotransference. It was the ones who were all alive at the time. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, the Tomb Kings, when Nagash, you know, let loose was all of them so not only do you have rival dynasties who didn't like each other in life going at it you have the same dynasty who now has all of its kings once back alive and they all have a pretty fair claim to the throne because all of them are the king (laughs) and it's kind of like well i'm the king i should be in charge no i am the king i should be in charge and like from a fairness standpoint it's like where do you where do you even how do you even handle that one It'll be like resurrecting all of the kings and queens of England, and then you go, so which one is legit right now? The king, yeah. <laughs> so I which hit... one's the king or the queen? You go, uh... <laughs> Me! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It so it was a very messy. Obviously, Necrons are more destructive, because, you know, sci-fi, they can blow up planets. But, like, pound for pound, I think the Tomb Kings had much more vicious infighting. Also, like, Tomb Kings... Are even more resistant to death than Necrons, like you said earlier. You know, like maybe one out of a million will have a recall failure, and he's gone. The Tomb Kings were so screwed over by Nagash; they just can't die. They will always <laughs> respawn to the point that Setra uses the skulls of Tomb Kings who pissed him off as catapult ammunition <laughs> uh, that self replenishes because it'll always just show back up via magic back in the catapult eventually. Because the Lich Priest can just keep bringing them back. Can't yeah, they? they just go as long as you have you have the Lich Priest who also can resurrect. You can keep bringing them. Back. Yeah, and some of them just come back on their own. Like there's a battle site in Nakakara that is two rival Tomb King armies that were cursed by the gods. So they just they just go at it every single day, nonstop. Oh. Uh, they and die and then part, they come back. An interesting part as well, like, they technically mm. had. There's a sort of similarity between, budget. um, like, do you do you think? In, I think it would be really cool if, in some like weird universe, like Nagash has technically like become a Katan shard in a way, in terms of his level of power. I mean, people are probably more powerful than. A, actually, no, depending on like scales of power, like, I think of um the Deceiver. Uh, what's the Death one called again? The the a Death Nightbringer. The, the Nightbringer. And then you put Nagash next to them. Like he could blend in quite handily with like Probably. that crew. And there's obviously the similarity between the fact of Nagash in the end times eventually like sort of takes control of all of the um Tomb Kings, takes yeah. them away from Cetra. At least you devour he, I think he, he goes into the, the realm he of He eats death. the god of the dead. <laughs> eats the god of the dead, nice. and then so then they can no longer resurrect Tomb Kings. Only Nagash can. So he and, uh, basically yeah. becomes it sort of mirrors the fact of it, they were essentially in, in, enslaved to a god who would then have to use, who would then use him to go fight another war. Yeah, except there was uh, there's no breaking out from Nagash, unfortunately. Yeah, this is 
it just uh, didn't happen yeah and then yeah nagash become by ages somewhere he just is an outright god now and of death so if you die welcome <laughs> <laughs> have fun with the gash. <laughs> you die, uh, maybe fighting him, and he's like, "Guess what? I'm your god now." Poke, poke, poke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another difference is that, like, the Tomb Kings, the Necron too. Again, cor prince. correct me if I mix missed it. Uh, never had any like psyker stuff amongst them. Yeah, they were yeah. always just pure tech. Even when they had souls, it was just no. We got technologies. No, mm. no magic. Well, because they uh, they see um. Is it chronomancy? Is like the, they have well, math, they, magic. Yeah, math. Yeah, they have the like power it, of science. Functionally and like on tabletop, especially, it's magic. Yeah, uh, just you can't deny it with a psyker. But it's um, the Tomb Kings, meanwhile, did have actual magic. Uh, they did eventually have to learn like how to properly use the winds of magic because Nagash cut them off from their gods. Just another thing to add to the list of awful things he's done. <laughs> Um, prior to that, they were, their magic was relying on like the gods intercessing on their behalf, which fun fact is a cool reference to the real life fact that only by the grace of God, will your tomb King miniatures stay together. <laughs> uh, I, it, oh. I, Setcher's mini brings me pain putting oh. that thing together. And I just think it's so cool. It's so cool. Does he, does like, he get rules for the tabletop? I think I was looking up. I think he does actually will be getting rules. Wow. Uh, he's I don't, the I don't only think... guy who gets to stick around. I, I guess that's fair. <laughs> I think there's like a couple other that might be coming back. I also don't know. Cause the old world just came out. Hmm. So I, they, they could be adding more. Setra, I believe does have rules. You do need to obviously get like the, the book, the, rule, the book. But I, I think yeah. I did read. I think he's just under 500 points. Sheesh. Uh, I, he's Setra, man. He's worth those points. Yeah, yeah especially yeah. he's obviously on a chariot as well, isn't he? So, yeah, he's. Yeah, so what's his chariot called down. again? It's the, um... uh, Chariot of the Gods. Because it can, nice. it can literally ram through formations. Like, there's nothing. There's no, it basically ignores any. Yeah, you speed bumps <laughs> you throw cetra at a block of infantry and then you forget about that block of infantry because it's probably gone <laughs> my favorite part about cetra is like his crown because isn't the crown is so powerful he, it blunts magic doesn't it or it reflects magic away from him uh yes and so he, when uh... yeah when nagash tried to fight him nagash is like the most powerful spell that's ever been done flung at him he's like <laughs> boing <laughs> just, <laughs> just yeah. hit like, some random ah, bloke, funny like, guy oh, in chariot nagash even has a spell that just <laughs> like on the tabletop that just kills just kills you <laughs> border print I mean, this, the cash didn't have vision <laughs> <laughs> he was willing um, to grind <laughs> listen dude, okay, I didn't, dude, dude. poor nagash is watching mr you know recreating ben hur everyone the film, <laughs> in the corner and the guy's like look oh, at me my, my four undead horses dude i'm on your side of border prince the mortal realms belong to nagash they just haven't figured it out yet <laughs> just haven't got the memo such is his power such as, the, <laughs> such as the power of Nagash. Grand That's Alliance death Satan. is the only valid one, uh, and 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 uh, chaos, but only if you're playing Skaven. I do hate uh, the fact that Nagash is just. I just, I just, well, I love to hate him. Dude, Nagash love, is like uh, slightly. Like, you know what's really weird though? Nagash is slightly more likable than Erebus. I'd say he's infinitely more <laughs> likable than Erebus because Erebus ruined everything in a way that's just like you're just awful. You suck. Now Nagash yeah. did the same thing, but it's fun when he's doing it. <laughs> if anyone's read uh, recent, no spoilers right now, but if anyone's read re like the end and the death volume three, I hate Erebus. Oh, does more. Erebus comes back? No, because he kills he kills someone dearly mm. beloved and important at the end, Aww. and it's just out of nowhere. That's right, the beloved character Erda. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is you're, you're gonna hate this. I don't know if you know the spoiler column, but you're gonna hate this. One. I, tell me when we're done. I don't wanna. I don't it wanna... makes me honestly. It makes me so. It makes me hate Erebus, <laughs> which I'm meant to do though. Yeah. Yeah, but, but um... I, I, I was. I remember making my video on Erebus, and I was just. God, I remember at the end of that guy. It's like this guy is so smarmy and like just like <laughs> yes, I'm so good. I've done everything right. Like it's just played out so good. And it's just like, yeah, your face is like got carving marks around the edges where Horace he's, took it off. He's like an amazing That's... chef who's made an amazing meal, but the only problem is he's made it out of one of your relatives. And it's just like <laughs> delicious. Yeah. Like, That's my nam. Like oh. but it tastes like, good, doesn't it? good at what he does, yeah. and it probably tastes good, but I don't want to taste it's it. It's what he oh. what he does is being awful. <laughs> See that? Okay, so go to Colin. Oh, no, you first. I you had something. More I was just saying the obvious 
I'll, I'll just add another point. So you want to you want to finish oh, that? I, I was going to say like just the last thing with Nagash and Erebus. The difference is when Erebus does it, it's this slimy, weaselly plan to ruin everything. <laughs> and when Nagash does it, he's just like uh, ten thousand skeletons. Uh, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> it's it's the scale of it. There's he can be a treacherous weasel, but for the most part, it's like he's a go big or go home kind of fellow. Yeah, he's not lying. Nagash is not lying. He'll straight up tell you, "I'm going to murder your entire." I, <laughs> like civilization <laughs> yeah he's honest and i'll feel, and I'll feel amazing doing it <laughs> he's honest about what's coming and what's coming is death <laughs> and he yeah he's just like thank you yeah as the boyfriend says he's just next to nagash just nagashes everywhere <laughs> nagash is over the setting <laughs> he, just, <laughs> he gets it i'll just say yeah, i'm gonna finish on the last point which i think is the very obvious link between these two is that they're basically ancient egypt if it was not obvious now just for oh you yeah. who are like listening just on audio the iconography the kind of well much more the tomb king the, the tomb kings are very much like a carbon copy of everyone here yeah. played rome rome total rome total war the first one uh, uh yeah they, they, yeah. they the tomb kings play like that just the sphinx can come alive and beat someone up <laughs> my favorite part of rome total war one was that well it's not called one but just rome total war was that the Egyptians in that were like the <laughs> <laughs> the ancient Egyptians, like Bronze Age, but then it was of the um, oh, what's the start date of Rome one? I think it's like two seventy BC. Yeah, because it's just before the car. Well, one of the Carthaginian Wars, one of the um, yeah, it's right before the Punic Wars start. Oh, Punic Wars, sorry. Um, two seventy BC. Hannibal... I was right. Yeah, we haven't <laughs> had any Hannibal of it, have we? In that, yeah, because you start out with just the Rome territory, don't you? God, that's such a good game. I, remember. I played that so much. God, uh, yeah, that's my. But kind of what you're thinking of. If anyone here, all if 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 we can ever find one person who's played, um, what's it? War Total War Troy, not Troy. What's the recent one that came out? A Pharaoh. I think. Pharaoh. Yeah. That's it. I, I love how we all like blank. Oh, that game. Man. So it's yeah. such a sad thing. Yeah, very sad. Um, but the ancient Egypt, even in today, like the gods as well. Both of them, they're kind of very much just obsessed with death even in when they were living although the necron tier for me for different reasons but i think the obsession of death sort of came from setra in a way didn't it it he definitely oh, no, they were already had gods of death and they, they had, had gods, gods of, of death, death and they like death was a sacred thing but with him founding the mortuary cult and getting the possibility of immortality out there that kicked it into overdrive of like yeah we are all about death now mostly because our leaders really want to avoid it. Hmm. Yeah, but there's to be fair, they I, I they kind of did make the Necrons their own thing, luckily, I think. Yeah. yeah. I think uh I think the way I heard it put online once was that the Tomb Kings are ancient Egypt and the Necrons are the Tomb Kings, but not necessarily just ancient Egypt. Like it's they copied the yeah. Tomb Kings, which copied ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. so the necrons are like a layer removed from ancient egypt but they have more than just ancient egypt going up does that make sense does what i'm saying yeah. like yeah, yeah so it's, it's yeah. not a carbon copy of it it's a copy yeah of a copy oh, that's uh, fair i think that's fair, that's fair. Yeah. and then of um, course uh the last okay, great comparison uh cetera is cooler than the Sion king i'm just i'm just gonna say it yeah, yeah that's true it's true. Silent King's got no law. Look at well, all the uh, fantasy you know, characters fair. are cooler than 40k characters pretty often. I feel like. Well, to be fair, the rest of the the rest of the Tomb King, uh, sorry, the rest of the Necron roster is kind of cooler than the rest of the Tomb King roster. If you know, I mean, like Kalida. Um, who's the other guy? Who's Ho not the Hotep? Kotep. Um, Kotep. Hotep's a different thing entirely. Uh, Kotep. I don't think they quite measure up to like Trezin or. Um, Imotech or something like that. I think they kind of hit a bit harder than again. I think Setra's. It's hard because Setra's kind of in his own realm, where Setra also outshines a lot of the other things, just because he's pretty much the height of badass in the setting. Well, like you don't. You, you can't. Yeah. You can't really get higher. No, tomb kings don't always have to be human, though. There's a dwarf tomb king that everyone thinks is a human that was just. So blessed by the gods that the power of their blessing made him short. People were talking about uh, Rupesh Seven. Yeah. People Mama in the chat what? talking about they're liking Erebus. Stop! Just stop. <laughs> I'm uh, so angry. Just Law Crumbs Total War stream. Possibly we could do uh, real, real border prince. Real, real, so real. 
Erebus was he's he's real one for that. Er, a border prince says Erebus was brave enough to reach for glory. Few understood. This. <laughs> yeah, but I wish I didn't because his glory sucks. <laughs> but Erebus does it because he's self-serving though. Like Erebus even states in his own things, he 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 thinks he's chosen by the gods, and he basically goes like, "Oh my god, me!" He's like the prom princess. He's like, "Oh my god," and uh, he basically. He's kind of doing it for the reward at the end, but the Chaos Gods are definitely gone. You've kind of served your purpose now. Go away. <laughs> yeah, so he he deserves everything. Him and Nagash deserve everything that's coming to them. <laughs> um, I think, though, with that being said, we probably are, we've done we covered quite a lot today. So, yep. um, I think yeah, thank you guys uh, so much for listening, for watching. Uh, it, more of Andy's pictures. <laughs> I don't know what that meant to be. That was there can overrun. At for uh, all think... your listeners, and is drawing some lovely pictures for you all to see. Uh, these are the current ones we've had up for the uh, stream. If yeah, you are listening as well, um, I know it's quite late into it, but please do give the video or um, Spotify link a like as well. It really does help, sort of, you know, push out a bit more when we get to talk about more interesting topics. And uh, if you guys have more topics you want us to cover, we've got quite a few lined up in the future we've got some more tier list ones don't harass us about tier list epic rap battles <laughs> because it's in the bag we know it's coming okay um with that being said though uh thank you eli and colin for giving us a huge amount of loyalty there and quite a lot and we'll catch you guys all in the next one peace Bye, Bye, you guys. Take care. Yeah. Love see you. you next week bye tomb king